Go ahead, Graham. Good evening, everybody. This, this college of complexes, I don't care where you thought you were. You might have thought it was the Hilltop restaurant, and you were not wrong. It is the Hilltop restaurant, and uh, it is also the College of Complex. And so, without any further ado, we will now hear from Nancy Wade. Yeah, but I wanted more of you. Oh. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. Um, I was here in 2012 addressing this group, and I'm glad to be seeing you again. Um, I wanted to start out with a little bit of background about who I am, um, in, uh, in case some of you don't know. Um, I'm a longtime activist, starting back in the 1970s. I was part of the feminist revival, and I first got my, my first taste of activism and excitement about political activism, walking in, uh, down the streets of Minneapolis shouting, take back the night, take back the night, and looking up at the buildings that during the day um, people would be uh, conducting business, things like that, and we were out in the streets and it felt like, yeah, what they say now, this is what democracy looks like. So later on, um, uh, I moved to Chicago 32 years ago, and we raised our children in Chicago in an area called Horner Park. Pardon me? And, um, and at that time, you know, I, I was probably a lot of people in the room who had the experience of you have children, and all of a sudden, this, this world looks uglier than it used to look, and you want to have the world change for those wonderful beings that you just brought into the world. So I became a community activist, and um, as a community activist, I was the president or vice president of Horner Park West for a civic organization for about 18 years. And we, I led fights to do things like um, downzoning for our neighborhoods. Probably a lot of you remember when, when uh, Single-family homes were being bulldozed, bungalows were being bulldozed, and these condos stacked on top of each other were going up everywhere, and many of them very, very unattractive, just plain uh, cedar, cinder block, and, and brick. So we actually got, we were one of the few neighborhoods who actually got down zoning for our neighborhood so that our single-family homes would stop disappearing and we knew, unlike the, the politicians at the time, we knew that there would once again be a downturn and we would be left with all of this overbuilding that uh, people wouldn't be able to afford. And sure enough, that happened. And um, one of the satisfactions that I had as an activist, I was in Alderman Mel's uh, ward at the time. So I was his, his so-called friendly enemy. I challenged him on a lot of things. Um, but he said to me many years later that because of my activism, probably our neighborhood was not hit as hard in the downturn because we didn't have as many uh, bigger buildings go up. So that was one thing that I did as an activist. I also led a fight to get a school by, uh, a, pardon me, a playground next to Bateman School. Um, that's something that I'm very, very proud of. It's a green space. It's a place for the kids to play a scaled down version of softball and the place has got a climbing gym there as well. And that wasn't going to happen unless we as a neighborhood organization took initiative, unless I took initiative to, to make that happen for, for the school. So um, those are some of the things that I did as an activist. So moving along to, uh, I, I now live in Lincoln Square and I, it's a neighborhood that didn't seem to need a lot of neighborhood organizing, so I stepped it up a notch and I became a move-on organizer. And I did that for two and a half years. 
during uh, the early part of Obama's administration. I was out there fighting for universal health care. And as such, our Move On group went to um, Dick Durbin and said, we want universal health care. What happened? How, how is it that, that the Democrats are not fighting for universal health care? And his representative said to us, well, the Tea Partiers were so loud. <laughs> And, you know, we're like, we're sitting, the group of us sitting there going, like, they were loud? Yeah. Didn't you, didn't you look at the polls? Didn't you, like, ask your own constituents what they wanted? The tea partiers were so loud? Mm -hmm. um, so this was like, you know, a wake-up call. Oh, well, I guess I gotta be louder. You want, I want something, I guess I gotta be louder. Uh, and, uh... We also went to um, Mike Quigley's office and we asked him to sign on to a jobs bill that Jan Schakowsky had introduced. You know, this was in 2008, 2009, when the recession was really hitting a lot of people hard and uh, unemployment was shooting up. And we wanted our representative to sign on to what was essentially a kind of WPA thing that Jan Schakowsky had introduced. And it, it took um, a lot of persuasion, including walking up and down in front of his office with signs and things like that. But he did sign on. And at that point, Move On was not happy with um, the activism that I was leading. And they said, you're bothering one of our guys. <laughs> And they kicked me out. And so I thought, well, you know, I'm an activist. I'm not a move on person. I'm not. Uh, I'm looking at the Democrats and I'm going, what, what is going on? What is going on? They are not pushing for what we really want and need. And um, so I decided, okay, kick it up another notch. I'm going to run for office. I'm going to run for Congress. And uh, fortunately I had a friend who had run for Congress for the Green Party, so I knew it could be done. And um, the Green Party helped me, telling me how to get ballot access. So in 2012, we submitted, we needed 5,000 signatures of registered voters to get on the ballot, and we needed to double that in order to survive a challenge. So we turned in 9,000 signatures, and that was in 2012. Um, that was a huge undertaking, and it was became most of the campaign for that time. Well, um, I got nearly five, five uh, almost six percent of the vote, 5.7 percent of the vote, 15,500 people, and that gave us established party status in the fifth district. So I turned to. Uh, the day of the, the election, I turned to my campaign manager and said, so, you want to do this again? And he said, okay. <laughs> and so, we're doing it again. So, I, I make a little light of that, but I, this campaign is, is very, very serious because we are fighting for very, very serious things. Someone here just earlier said, what a crisis that we're facing as humanity, that, that the climate crisis is, is, the, is the, by far the greatest danger that humanity has ever faced. And we don't hear our politicians standing up and saying that. They are not saying that. No, what are they doing? They're taking us to war to defend fossil fuel interests. They're taking us into endless war to defend fossil fuel interests. That's what we're doing in the Middle East. It, it's not about terrorism. It's not about humanitarianism. It is about the fact that Chevron wants to protect its interests in the Middle East and other fossil fuel interests. So we're not hearing our politicians say the truth. We're not hearing them do the, uh, the things that, they, that need to happen for us. And so that's what this campaign is about, is speaking the truth, speaking the truth, and speaking it as loudly as possible. 
The Green Party, as you may know, does not take corporate donations. So we're not looking over our shoulder like, like the incumbent is, hey, Boeing, what do you want me to do right here? You want me to stand strong against a uh, renewed war in the Middle East? Oh, no, you don't? You make money off of that? Oh, gosh. You know, I won't say anything then. Don't take corporate donations. That does mean that we do need donations from people, from individuals. And I'm happy to say there's been a lot of people who have donated to this campaign. And so we have been able to do some things that uh, Green Party campaigns, um, uh, to my knowledge, in Illinois have not been able to do so, so far. Um, we have a digital sign that is at Fullerton and Ashland. Um, if you're headed south on Ashland, you will see my face 10 by 10 feet wide. Uh, a little embarrassing, but you know, you gotta, you gotta get the word out there. But the other thing that that sign says is, I'm endorsed by the independent voters of Illinois. And that is a fantastic honor. A fantastic honor. Thank you. The IBI IPO endorsed me in the 5th Congressional District, and, and um, I, I'm so honored that that happened. And that will help us to get the message out. <clears throat> So I told you about that digital sign, and there is another, another digital sign at Southport and Wellington. So thousands and thousands of people each day are seeing these signs. It is, it is a challenge. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm a little under the weather, so if I cough and that sort of thing, excuse me. It is really a challenge to get the word out in the in the fifth district. Um, buying media, as we know, if you're buying media in Chicago, it's incredibly expensive. Um, so we we've been trying to really creatively think of ways to get the word out, and these digital signs are one. We're doing Facebook posts um, that you can boost to spread the word that way. And um, I know that everybody hates robocalls, but we're going to do some robocalls, too. And so cost-effective ways to get the word out. So let me just get my notes. Hold on one second. Okay, so I wanted to let you know what the, the main issues are for me and the Green Party in this campaign. I'm running to provide progressive leadership in the 5th Congressional District, something we do not have. Um, as a Green Party candidate, I mentioned I don't take corporate donations, um, and I'm answerable, therefore, only to the people. The greatest ch challenge facing us today is climate change, and we must take immediate and bold steps to stop it and to reverse it. And these things can be done. Um, we can start with ending the subsidies to fossil, fuels com fossil fuel companies. We send them billions of our tax dollars every year. It's a dying industry. It's taking us along with it. We need to use these billions of dollars in tax money to foster green energy, and in so doing, to employ millions of people in jobs that cannot be outsourced. We need to retrofit our cities. We're wasting 40% of our energy in a, in a city like Chicago, just letting it radiate out through the walls. That is something that we can be serving on, as well as building green new buildings. But the greenest building is one that's already been built. So conserving energy through in already existing structures in places like Chicago is extremely important. I advocate a carbon tax. We absolutely must have a carbon tax. The sooner, the better. Um, a carbon tax. The, the carbon tax that I advocate would be revenue neutral. That means we pay more at the pump. We pay more to heat our homes. Not tremendously more. We only need. In order to have an effective carbon tax, we would be paying maybe 25 cents more a gallon. But 
Revenue neutral means that we then get a credit on our income tax so that our the overall impact to the average person's budget uh, and the income of the average household, that would not be impacted. But it would be, give us an incentive to move away from fossil fuels and to go, move towards green energy. I advocate a Wall Street transaction tax. As we all know here, it was Wall Street, yeah, it was Wall Street that tanked our economy, um, that no bankers have gone to jail. And I view the Wall Street transactions tax as an opportunity for Wall Street to pay reparations for the damage that it did to our economy. Thank you. Uh, a fee of 0.0% on each dollar on speculative transactions. Now, a lot of times when I talk about this uh, to, to voters on the street, um, they go, no, no, my bank charges me too many fees right now. It's too expensive to do banking right now. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, but the average person has not necessarily heard of this concept, so it, it's important to explain. Talking about the speculative Wall Street transactions, the kind that are done uh, by the millions on the computers that, that make the spikes in, in, um, on, on the results, those kinds of transactions, which should be slowed down doesn't, and, and is not impacting the average person, um, it would generate in Illinois alone billions of dollars that we could use towards green energy and for other programs that would benefit people, uh, the 99%, if you will, not the 1%. Point of information, Nancy, is it 0 0.01, is it, that's what you yeah. said? It came point, close, point zero. Point zero 0.01. Yeah. Yeah, 0.01, right. Um, we still need universal health care. Everybody in, yeah. nobody out. We still need it. Yeah, thank you. Right, and there's... We can expand Medicare to everyone, and we can, in the process, dramatically improve the quality of care. Um, I think that many of us here understand that Obamacare was just insurance reform. It wasn't health care reform. Now, I'm not going to talk against Obamacare, because as, as a person who's been self-employed most of my life, and my husband has been self-employed most of his life. It's nice to be able to go on the website now that it's finally working and actually be able to buy a policy that costs us less than the policy that we were paying for before. That's nice. But the idea that the insurance companies who do nothing but make life miserable for doctors by having to shuffle the papers back and forth they, they don't heal anybody, they don't help anybody, they just make money off of me and my family and all of us needing health care. They don't do anything for us. Yeah. Let's just get rid of them and go directly, pay directly to the doctors through Medicare for All. Let Medicare negotiate for better prices on drugs. There's, uh, it's unbelievable that there is a law that says Medicare cannot do this, there, that Medicare cannot negotiate for better drug prices. So let's take care of that and, and let uh, the economies of scale work. We can and should provide free higher public education to everyone who yes. qualifies. And I'm not talking just college, I mean training programs as well. And the amazing thing is, we are already paying more than it would take to do this. We are paying through, the federal government is paying $77 billion a year through tax credits, through uh, subsidized loans, <clears throat> pardon me, Tax credits, subsidized loans, and grants, $77 billion a year are going towards that. Students who are going to public institutions pay $60 billion a year in tuition. Let's cut out the middleman. Let's save money here, and let's go directly to free higher education. Germany just did this. 
and like many other things that Germany is doing, including uh, having 25% of its energy now through renewables and closing down most of its nuclear plants, Germany can do it, we can do it. Yeah. So free public higher education would free our students from the burden of debt that some of them have the rest of their lives, like indentured servitude. They have the rest of their lives. And free from that debt, they can invest in building families, in housing, and in innovative new businesses. Their, their creativity and their power to invest in our economy would be free. We must get the big money out of politics. Corporations, as we know, are not people, and money is not speech. We need a constitutional amendment that says exactly that. I'm the only candidate who is advocating, pardon me, who is advocating any of these things. I am the only candidate who is speaking out for truly progressive, common sense policies. These are common sense policies. I'm the only one speaking out for them. I'm the only one who gives people in the 5th Congressional District an opportunity to truly vote their values. Um, and if you live in the 5th District, where we are right now, I hope I can count on you for your vote. You have an opportunity not just to hold your nose and so-called vote for the lesser of two evils. We know there's kind of no lesser of those two evils. So you actually have an opportunity to vote your values. Um, so, vote for me, support me, Nancy Wade, a Green Party progressive candidate for the 5th Congressional District. Thank you. I don't know what the protocol is, so I'm going to wait. Let's see, uh, Mary Bennett, and then uh, Marlene, uh, and we'll get to the rest of you. Who's Marlene? Uh, no, no, Mary. Um, have you gotten any endorsements from any labor unions at all? No, unfortunately, as um, as our dear Karen Lewis, and let's all send some good thoughts to her, some good thoughts to her. No, uh, I'm saying she's very dear to me. I, I'm, I'm just so set, sending good thoughts that she will be, she'll be able to be on the campaign trail and I'm going to give her a thousand percent out um, and, and as soon as that's possible to do. Um, she said to me, the, uh, the labor unions are in an abusive relationship with Democrats. Uh, you know, like uh, someone who's beaten all the time and still comes back for more. So, unfortunately, no. Labor unions are still, um, they're kind of, <laughs> an abusive relationship is kind of the best way to describe it. It's like the, the Democrats say, oh no, we'll be better to you, we'll be nicer to you, it won't happen again, honey. And so labor unions continue to support the Democrats, and then the Democrats come back and beat them up, and the cycle starts all over again. Um, Green Party is the way to go for the labor unions, but they haven't figured out how to, how to break the cycle yet. So, no. Um, or have you also just, uh, have you approached the National Organization for Women to get, try to get their endorsement? Mm, that, I have not, actually. I have not. That would be, that would be a good thing to try to do. Yeah. All right, Mary. Marlene. Uh, Marlene. 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 Um, Marlene. Yeah. Uh, I I I know people that live in that Caddy Colmer building on Belmont. As well, well, it's on right a block north of Belmont and Clark. And Mike Wigley and Tawny, they're always throwing little parties here and there for the seniors. The seniors love them. They're going to have I think a polling. Um, polling booth right there in the building. So I don't even know if, you know, I don't know how you can reach that group. That's, that's a, a lot of people. Yes, well, you know, I hate to say it, but it does come down to that good old M-O-N-E-Y. It really comes down to that. Um, we're, uh, the incumbent has 
over half a million dollars. So, you know, we we have we raised ten thousand. I'm really proud of that. So that's really great. Um, but money is what it takes to get the word out. Money is what it takes to get the word out. So we're as I as I mentioned in the in my introduction. Um, we're doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can, and and it just may very well be a a building process to look to the future. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, has it been an effective uh, an election uh, tool to note to the groups that you speak to that Mike Quigley has signed on to the Trans Pacific Par uh, uh, Partnership? which will drain so many thousands of jobs out of the USA, and that uh, he's a, uh, not at all standing up for working people? I mention this whenever I have an opportunity, and I have been to um, the Polish-American Leagues, uh, it's called PALPAC, Polish-American League Political Action Committee, uh, for their endorsement session. I have been to the Hellenic voters endorsement sessions um, and I talk about the TPP and there is, you could hear a pin drop, you could hear a pin drop when I say the TPP just like NAFTA is coming for our jobs, is coming for your small businesses. These are, as I mentioned, these are immigrant uh, organizations of mostly immigrant business people who do have small businesses. So I'm just, it's like, it's like Cassandra crying into the wilderness, you know, and nobody's listening. But that's part of what the campaign is about, is speaking the truth and trying to get people to hear. If, the, if uh, either of these groups with all the small businesses that they have and all the working people, just Google TPP, just look, you know, whatever you think of me. Open up your computer and find out what the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal is because it is bad. You know, NAFTA was bad, this is even badder. So uh, part of what I try to do is in the, in the usually three minutes that they give you at the microphone is to say, Trans-Pacific Partnership deal, bad, look it up. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, who knows? Who knows if it makes an impact, but I'm out there trying. Okay. Yes. yes, and, uh... Ah... <coughs> uh, Conrad, no. Yes, your... Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't have a question for Nancy, but I, I, I told Nancy I was going to horn in on it a little bit here. But I do want to say, I've got to know Nancy, uh, when I got involved with the Green Party, and Nancy came on board, that uh, I've told people, getting involved with the Green Party makes you feel like expecting a quote-unquote progressive Democrat to represent you is like believing in Santa Claus. And, and once you stop believing, you really can't go back. But we do need good candidates to run against these people. And I think everybody should vote for Nancy, should write her a check. We need people like Nancy running for Congress, running for Aldermen, running for whatever. But I'm here tonight because Nancy's, uh, you said a thousand percent you're supporting Karen Lewis? Oh yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. Karen Lewis is a hero to anybody who's involved in education. Anybody who's fighting corporate, quote unquote, corporate reform. Uh, I've been out collecting signatures for Karen to be on the ballot in February. So I am here with. Do you have a cluster? No, I have, a, I have, a, I have an announcement to make. I need people to sign. The question and answer right? period. Anybody who wants to see Karen on the ballot, model. I need your right. signature. Thank you. All right. Well, well, please pass like it around with your signature yeah. and your address if you live in Chicago. Save it for the report. All right. Thank you. Uh, Bill Wet. Uh, do you know anything about a Matt Rachel who lives in this area and was interested in Austrian school economics? I met Matt once, briefly. I, I, I don't really know him. I have heard that he ran in this district, and I think he got 4% of the vote, which I thought was pretty great. Yeah, well, I'd like to do his email or something. Mm, no. 
Yes. Uh, ben Weinberg? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, what does it cost for a minute on Channel 7 at 10 o'clock at night? That's a good question. I can tell you how much a digital sign for one month costs, $2,380. Wow. And uh, then there's another one. Boy, I wish we'd check this one out sooner. That one for a month is $1,200. Uh, so, <laughs> so I think uh, my speculation is the, 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 that kind of uh, television coverage would be in multiples of what the signs are. So why don't you take money from like Ben and Jerry's and an ice corporation? The Green Party made a commitment um, at, at like no, no corporate and for that matter no union donations. Yeah, so it was, it was a tough moral choice. But I really feel that um, it's, especially as time goes on, as, as the, the rivers of money that are buying our politicians, as the Citizens United decision came down, it, it was the right choice. It was the right choice. Uh, Richard, or, all right, uh, first, uh, no, this uh, is right. I have a first of all, uh, no, I guess my quick reason. Louder, Don. Correct. Okay. Uh, is there a Republican running against him? What are his chances yeah. of winning? Um, Vince Colbert is the Republican. And uh, traditionally in the 5th District, the Republicans get somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the vote. No matter who has is in that slot it seems like um both of the clowns could be on the you know slot of republican in the fifth district and people would vote for that person with the republican line so okay so yeah. 20 about 20 percent uh, about 20 20 somewhere between 20 25 percent okay yeah and but i i do think that some of that is uh not necessarily a dedication to Republican mm -hmm. ideas, but a protest vote. It's like, you know, the, the 5th District historically uh, was Ross Kalski's district, then more recently it was Rod Bogoyevich's district, and then Rahm Emanuel's district. And um, I think there is definitely a feeling that the, there is a, a pushback against the history of Democrats in the fifth district. Not not necessarily a good history. Gene Harker. The United States gives three billion dollars a year to Israel, about a billion and a half to uh, Egypt. Do uh, you favor that or would you work against it? I do not favor that. Um, I think that one of the as I as I mentioned before, we're going to war over fossil fuels. Well, the the involvement that we have in the Middle East in in every respect is about fossil fuel interests. And uh, so we we're basically we're spreading bribes around so that people will protect our fossil fuel interests in that area of the world. And unfortunately our our meddling as we see has only increased problems, not not uh, solve them, not solve them. So it's not the right direction to be going in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike Lee. Good, I need to. Uh, oh, uh, have you ever thought of Can running, um, first of all, is there is anybody else, this is the, uh, have you ever thought of running for a Democrat sorry, as sorry. a Democrat against Quigley in you know, like a primary? Let me just ask that. No. The short answer is no. And why, why? No, because I uh, I feel so strongly that the Democrats are just compromised. They're just compromised. They're not. They're not your. Uh, you know, my grandpa is Democrats, although. My grandpa was a socialist, so it wasn't just Democrats either. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it, it's just even even the most fair-minded, the most you know, the cleanest people you can think of who are going to run as Democrats, 
They're going to be corrupted. They're going to be corrupted. Embedding themselves in the Democrats is going to be corrupting to them. So, no, I wouldn't do you, that. You could, though. You could go and turn to a primary against uh, Quigley, against the, uh, right? Is well, it's, it's theoretically possible anybody can do that. But, no, I wouldn't. Nobody's done it. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, Butler and then uh, Ayala. Yeah, I I realize that uh, you know nobody wants to become too compromised, but it's been said time and time again that the very nature of politics is the ability to make compromises to get at least half of what you want this time around, and uh, by not taking funds from unions and from corporations, oh, yeah. and by uh, not playing the, uh, you know, uh, the appeals of the traditional uh, political parties, don't you kind of make it difficult for you to win this time around or maybe even the next few times around? Yeah, Isn't the purpose of running for public friend? office to win? The purpose is definitely to win. No doubt about that. The purpose is definitely to win. Um, has the Green Party made it more difficult for ourselves? No question about it. The good news is that with uh, the Green Party does 10 times better with less funds. The ratio is like 10 to 1 with, of, of uh, results, voting results, to, to the funds that we have. So in other words, my $1 goes 10 times farther with the voters than the compromised one dollar of the, the corporate bot party. And you mentioned the word compromise. There's different, as we know, and I know you're, you're a, a student of the English language, Pat, um, there's different meanings for compromise. So compromise meaning uh, corrupted, that, that, that's one kind of compromise, of meaning, meaning corrupted. And anyone who uh, the question was, would I run as a Democrat? That would be corrupting, in my opinion. But uh, the idea of being able to come to a compromise in a, in, a, in a negotiation, I don't find that to be a bad thing. I, I find that to be a good thing. We throw our ideas in the ring. We throw um, what, what the voters want in the ring, and we hash it out from there. Uh, but what we, we don't have, we're not having what the voters want right now. We're having what the, the corporate backers of our representatives want. The voters are not listened to. As an example of me being in Dick Durbin's office and having him say the Tea Party was so loud. The Tea Party is not his constituency. Right. They're, they're not his constituency. Why is he paying attention to them? You know? That, that's, uh, I think that's it in a nutshell. So we heard, uh, we heard a few challenges to strategy of the Greens. What are the main points, Nancy, of criticism against the Greens platform? Mm -hmm. Well, um, that depends on from what angle you're coming at it from. Um, when I was at the, uh, the Polish endorsement um, meeting, there was a gentleman who came up to me, and I used that word very, very liberally, gentleman, who came up to me and began literally screaming in my face because I dared to say that universal health care would be a good idea. He kind of objected to that part of my platform strenuously enough to be this far away from me and say, universal health care and fascism. Yeah, that's, like, that's right. Whoa! <laughs> Nancy, so, I have a question. You know me, and you know that I spent about 35 years working as a Democratic precinct captain. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I was a kid, they told me, well, you got to work with the Democrats. Only if they decide to change can we have, ever make any progress. So I spent a lifetime working for the Democrats. 
Now I'm 71. Should I spend a second lifetime? Should you spend a second lifetime working with the Democrats? You think that would work out if I, I worked until I was 140? Would I get anywhere with him? No. <laughs> I, I think you're answering your own question there, Wes. <laughs> Yeah, if there is no hope in getting the Democratic Party to respond to the wishes of the average person, what are we ready for the formation of a, as they do in some other countries, uh, a U.S. Labor Party? Coming over. It's called the Green Party. Yeah, it's called the Green Party. Thank you, Conrad. But I mean, more union-oriented, more labor-oriented. Uh, well, you know, I'm standing here as a big fan of uh, alternative parties, so we definitely need other parties, and we need for the, the bar not to be so high, in, in Illinois in particular, for ballot access. Illinois has one of the highest bars um, to getting on the ballot that there is in the country. And so uh, what the Green Party and I actually advocate is publicly financed elections uh, where the candidates prove through a number of, a designated number of small donations. Say, say the 9,000 signatures that I turned in. Let's say that those were $9,050 donations and that's what proved that I should be on the ballot, that what people wanted an alternative. And then match that money with public funds, but have only small donations and public funds finance our elections, and not the, you know, as I said, we need a constitutional amendment to stop what's happening now, which is the, the unlimited flow of unidentified funds. So really to bring it back to government by the people. And that's what public publicly funding funded elections would do. Uh, okay. Nancy, I'd like to ask you a question of a more personal nature. Um you you've decided to run for Congress. What can you give us a little personal reflections on on what it may have cost you or some of the maybe some of the personal decisions that went into running, and second of all, if you could kind of comment on the role of public speaking in your campaign and how it affects uh, the way people perceive you a little bit. Um, the Both campaigns have been a tremendous, uh, a, a wonderful experience for me um, on a personal level. It's been a very challenging experience on a personal level. Very challenging, but we only grow through challenges. So I feel like I've grown tremendously um, in the last three years now through campaigning. And, um, and I can say that as someone who is now 59 years old, it's pretty awesome to be growing at 59. <laughs> so so um, I'm happy to have taken on this challenge, and I see, I see possibilities ahead that when I started, I, I didn't necessarily see. You know, we grow through new experiences, so I see possibilities that I didn't see before. Has there been, you know, moments when my, my chief campaign booster, my husband, at midnight is going like, close the computer, it's time to stop now, and, and uh, you know, there's other things in life other than the, the Green Party campaign for Congress, so could you just stop now? Yeah, but at the same time, my chief campaign booster, my husband, says, you know, this is important. This is important. It's cutting into our personal life. Uh, it, is, it is invading every corner of family life. Um, but it's important. It's tremendously important because uh, you are giving me, he says about himself, you're giving me an opportunity to vote my values. You're giving our family and our friends and the, and the many other thousands of people who, who that I meet on the street who go, Great, you know, I'm so glad. Not, I'm so disgusted with the Democrats. I'm so disgusted with the Republicans. I am ready 
for a third party candidate. I am happy to see you. I am happy to vote for you. So that, that's a big satisfaction to me. Yeah, how'd you do it? Do you have any idea? Have you done any polling or anything? We don't have the money to do polling. And if anyone wants to be an angel of mercy and you know, give us the money to do polling, that would be awesome. But it costs a lot of money to do those things. And um, no, I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay. All right. I just had a, this is a little kind of related to Laura, Dr. Laura's question. Um, okay. Are, are you going to be on the ballot? Oh, yeah. I'm on the ballot. Okay. 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 All right. Now, if you're elected this, if you are actually win this election and you get elected to Congress, you said that you've said that, that you could, you basically consider all the Democrats to be bad. All right. Does that mean not exactly bad? Corrupt. Bad is a different judge. Judge. I think the word you used was corrupt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, now, my question: Does this mean that you would refuse to uh, caucus with the Democrats in the House of Representatives, as Bernie Sanders has done in the U.S. Senate? No. And and I do want to clarify. I do think that um, the Democrats are are by, sort of by definition, because all politicians are taking this corporate donation slash bribes, yeah. they are inherently corrupted. Do, do I mean that there's individuals who still don't have their heart in the right place and are doing their best? There are individuals who have their heart in the right place and are doing their best. And some of those individuals are in the Progressive Caucus in of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives. Uh -huh. And they would be people that I would work with. Those are people that I would work with. Uh, when push comes to shove, the Democrats in the Progressive Caucus line up behind their president. Even if he's doing stuff like you know, arming, arming the so-called good rebels in Syria, they line up behind him. That's not something I would do. But on other things where we have common ground, where we have agreement, um, for instance, uh, I still think that Jen Schakowsky's bill for, it's called the, um, something like American, Emergency American Jobs Act or something like that, that's still in play. I still think that's a good thing. A, a, a revival of the WPA, we still could use that. And, and it says things like create a youth core and a senior core. Um, and refurbish our parks, just like the WPA did. It's, it's got lots of good things in it. That is something that I could definitely get behind. Yeah, but I guess my real question is, would your winning this election uh, increase or reduce the chances of the Democrats getting a majority in the House of Representatives once again? Well, I don't know because what I would do for you, electing well, well, Democrats, okay. but I would let certainly me, be on board me, for some of their clear, policies. Let me clarify a little bit. If you recall, it's, there's some of you who may not be old enough to remember this. Back in the year 2001, mm -hmm. uh, Republican James Jeffers mm -hmm. left the Republican Party, de declared himself an independent, and then began caucusing with the Democrats, which suddenly caused them to get a majority in the Senate. Now, so I guess my original question is, would you, would you be willing to caucus with the Democrats, or are you going to kind of refuse and be and represent a kind of, or, or are you going to caucus with the Republicans, let's say, or are you going to kind of refuse to 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 to, to caucus with either party and just say, no, I'm on neither side. Wow. <laughs> Wait till she gets a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is this. Got to figure this out. Now. <laughs> well, okay. So let let's have some definitions here. Caucus with does that mean always vote with? No, it doesn't mean that. Okay, Doesn't so because my answer already is, is no, I would not always vote with okay. the okay, Democratic that's not Caucus. What it means. Okay, well, what you, with what the Progressive means, Caucus. What it means is that what it means is that if they, if if elsewhere the Dems or independents who who work with them like like uh, uh, get enough seats in the House of Representatives, then Nancy Pelosi is going to once again become the Speaker. And, and the Democrats will once again have the leadership in the House of Representatives, unlike John Boner and the Republicans. 
Nancy, you right. would caucus with the Democrats. Yep. Yeah, I think I said that. that. Yes, I think okay. I said okay. that. Okay. I'm going to answer I would, I would vote with the progressive Democrats some of the time. Okay. When I agree with them. Okay. Does that answer the question? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I guess there's different ways of leading a country to politics. Um, there's chaos, there's fighting, like in some countries. Anyway, so what I'm saying is money. I mean, is there an alternative way to have elections? I mean, uh, you, are you hungry? Okay, no worries. Yeah, publicly financed election. Only, only publicly financed election. Yeah, right here, baby. I think Connecticut has it right now. I'm pretty sure it's Connecticut that has it right now. Completely publicly financed election. Yeah, so yes, it's possible. It's being done. Um, the the things that the Green Party advocates as in the Green Party platform, but the majority of them, 98% of them, are actually being done now in various places. It's just that we need to catch up. Single payer in Vermont. Yeah. Single payer. You know, well, single payer in many places in, in other countries, of course. Proportional representation. Yeah. Many countries. Mike Lee, Kevin Walton. Uh, I gotta get personal. I think you'd be a really great uh, congressman. Uh, did your I'd husband be a great, great congressman. Woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you gonna be uh, <laughs> great governor? Are, is your, uh, your your husband isn't here, right? No. How no. Many, can I get like background on you? Oh, College sure. degrees, kids, yeah, where absolutely. you work, are you working now? Sure. I mean, I, it's kind of personal. Yeah, I actually stuff, meant to do that. I, I skipped that part. Try on your website. Y'all have asked me that, too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I have a master's in teaching language arts, and I got that in 2005 when I was 50 years old. Yay! <laughs> um, and before that, I have, uh, in 1978, I got a bachelor's in speech and communications from the University of Minnesota. Um, and um, let's see, the, the master's is from Northeastern, right here in Chicago. Um, after I, I got that master's in teaching, um, I taught in the Chicago public schools. It was very difficult to get hired then, uh, it's very difficult to get hired now. Um, and I was hired though, uh, at a school on the south side that served what then was left of the Robert Taylor Homes. Um, it was, you know, Mayor Daly had the idea that has since been carried out of tearing down all the Robert Taylor Homes and uh, dispersing um, the poor folks of the city, dispersing them all around. Um, and the students that I had, I had sixth grade students, and it was also at the time when No Child Left Behind came in, um, and which is sort of like no, no teacher left with any self-esteem, uh, that's what I call it instead, is we, we will allow no teacher or student any self-esteem. Um, at, that came in. It was like one of the first years that it came in, when the when the emphasis on testing was happening, and when the teacher bashing and student bashing was coming in. So uh, one of the effects was um, I had a self-contained sixth grade classroom, which should not ever happen to sixth graders and should not ever happen to one teacher, uh, because the 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 definition of a teacher who is qualified. There might be a teacher, as there was in my school, teachers who've been teaching science for the last 10 years, but suddenly, because they didn't have uh, two specialized courses in it, they were no longer qualified. So our entire school went to a self-contained classroom. So I was teaching all the subjects, science, math, social studies, um, everything, reading. Um, and to sixth graders. So it was a disservice to them because no one at sixth grade level can be an expert in all of those things. 
Um, and the teachers who were the experts, they were not allowed anymore. You know, it took a long time for this all to shake out. But that was part of No Child Left Behind. Um, so the other part was that my students were um, extremely disadvantaged. Not only that, they were afraid that they'd be homeless any day. Their homes were being torn down. They had watched all their friends' and neighbors' homes being torn down. So uh, my experience as a sixth grade teacher was teaching students who didn't have glasses. They couldn't see the board. If I put something up on the board, there was a, a percentage of them who couldn't see the board. So it's been mostly teaching. They, they were, and I'm making this point because another thing that I'm very concerned about is education and what's happening to with the war on teachers. Um, so the, the students that I had were, were very, very needy students. But they were very typical of students on the South Side. So I, I taught that year, and uh, I was told by seasoned teachers that in five years it's going to get better. And I did the math, and five years I'm 55. I'm not sure this is going to work out uh, because this is so tough right now. And I don't think they're going to have glasses in another five years. So what, what it did was give me as a, a perspective as as um, an activist, as someone now who is running for office, that the, the war on teachers is, is, I felt its personal detriment, the war on students, I felt its personal detriment. What is wrong with our school system is poverty. That is what is wrong with our school system, poverty. So I went on from there to, um, to do substitute teaching in the Chicago public schools. And that gave me the perspective of, you know, as a teacher, what I'd be doing is perpetuating a bad system. And I'm not talking about um, uh, the rhetoric of, oh, public schools are so bad. I don't think public schools are bad. Though I, I teachers were breaking their butts every day to do a great job. Uh, but what teachers are doing through no fault of their own, is to perpetuate the, the class system in this country, and the class system. If I had stayed in a school that was, all the kids were in poverty, and I had, would not be allowed to teach that uh, Columbus brought slavery to this country, and he annihilated the Native Americans where he stepped foot on their islands and he cut their hands off so if they didn't mine gold for him. If I said I had to teach how fabulous Columbus was, you know, he's so good, I couldn't do it. I simply, there came a day when I was like, I cannot buy into this. I can't do it. I, I trained, I studied for six years, I wanted to be a teacher, and I cannot do it. That was tough. That was really hard. However, I am still a teacher. The good news is, I am still a teacher. And uh, I teach part-time. I teach a program which is an after-school science program. And I get to bring a big box of stuff in to, to uh, elementary school kids and say, let's learn about the planets today. And let's mix some uh, vinegar and, and uh, some baking soda together. And let's make things happen. And, it's really fun, <laughs> and I really like it. And and I'm still teaching some of the the disadvantaged kids. Some of them have grants to have this program in. So I feel like in my my own way, I'm making a difference in that. Um, and the other good news is, in the other part of my time, I get to be a candidate, a Green Party candidate for Congress. I would comment on it. You're still doing. You're still teaching right now to this audience. Oh, so it you. isn't like you know you put that's that totally comment. outside. That's a comment. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Paul. Where does the Green Party stand on abortion and homosexual marriage? Uh, we were some of the we were like the first on board for saying equal rights for for everyone for LGBTQ people equal rights and marriage um, for 
people who want to get married. Um, as far as abortion goes, it should be a woman's choice. It's a choice between a woman and her doctor, and it should be what about the child's freely available. Choice? It should be freely available, and that's what I believe. And um, if you want to, you want to come and talk to me about it after this. We could probably do that, but that's what I believe. All right. Yeah, I've been following the Ebola problem. And it seems that Thomas Duncan, the guy who just died of Ebola, had 103 fever and all the symptoms of Ebola, and he went to the Presbyterian Hospital in Dallas. This is a question. And because Obamacare allows states to opt out, he had zero health coverage of any kind. So they looked at that, and they looked at that, and they decided to send him home with a bottle of pills. Two days later, an ambulance brings him. He, now he's clearly dying. And they look for health coverage. And his temperature is worse. The signs are all worse. This guy's got a ball and there's no question. And they just, they're getting ready. They, they're rehydrating him first. And then they're going to send him home with a new bottle of pills. Mm -hmm. And at this point, a friend of his called the CDC and said, this is the story. This spells E-B-O-L-A, what do you think? Oh my God. And, the, and the CDC went nuts and called the hospital and said, you have to take him. But I, I read in the paper yesterday that the hospital has okay. to eat the cost. This, and this I okay. remember lobbying now, my Democratic okay. representatives about okay. national health and I checked this with caseworkers, and they do have okay. to eat the cost under the rules. Okay, the All right, now real quick. So the Democrats said what's that's too question? radical. We can't have national health. What's your response? Universal health care, Medicare for all. Okay. okay. A brief reminder to everybody at the college: this is the question period. Yes. There will be uh, adequate time in about the next three or four minutes to uh, rebut the speaker in full. You'll be timed and you'll have a chance to get up there and rebut. Uh, How much time do we have left, Jim? It's about 7.53 now, but I think we got a lot of rebutters, so let's get into a couple of people who haven't had a question and then move into it real quick. Ileana. My question about holistic medicine, because I'm in yeah. holistic medicine field. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, and I respect, and I believe in holistic medicine very, very, very much, together with the traditional medicine. So my question is, uh, some of the, uh, you know, health doesn't cover insurance, and I would like to have clients, and I don't have really much clients right now in the response, because Nobody want to pay cash, you know, from the pocket. That's what they claim. Uh, so my question is, uh, can the lobbying more uh, for the insurance for holistic medicine as well, include the acupuncture, um, Reiki uh, practitioners, the Japanese method of the physical therapy? Um, well, um, I'm I'm a big fan of of uh, alternative medicine because my husband is an acupuncturist and he has a very successful practice and he accepts only only direct payment. He does not accept insurance, and uh, it is my opinion that um, that alternative practitioners should not be interested in having insurance companies cover them because, because, um, doctors do nothing but complain about how they're nickel and dimed by the insurance companies and how they're not paid enough by the insurance companies. So, I know from personal experience that you can have a very successful practice being paid directly and I encourage you to, to focus on that because you, in the long run, you'll actually be much better off. Can I add it just a little bit from just from my practice and from my experience, okay? Because it's, okay, um, hold on. So, give me two minutes. 
Um, so I finished two courses. I'm two level practitioner, right? Like Reiki, it's Japanese method, physical therapy. So and it was not cheap this course. And uh, what I tried to tell you, uh, you mentioned doctors. Okay. So actually, it's none of them business because it's two different level of the practice. So. Doctor not give referral to your husband acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. You know, doctor don't give referral for the patients. Acupuncturist need to find it his own clients. And I understand it takes time, but it's not easy. So my question is, it <coughs> would be very, very, very actually good if we can have insurance for holistic sum of the field. And then it's going to be payment somehow because people get used to pay from the pocket. It's very difficult to, to establish business like private practice. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Well, um, I, once again, I really, from, it's from personal experience that I know that you can have a successful practice and have it be cash-based. But in the near future, maybe there will be something. And, and it is also from personal experience that I know that it would actually undermine your practice to have be, it be paid through insurance. So I really encourage you to, to think more positively about having a cash-based practice, because right. you'll do okay. Well, like, uh, what would be your biggest critique of Mr. Quigley's performance? Um, can, you, um, can you repeat the question, please? I he said that what would be my biggest critique of Mr. Quigley's performance? Um, he is... Uh, I characterize it as a do-nothing placeholder for the Democratic Party. He's not, uh, he's not someone who is proactive. Uh, he's an echo chamber for the administration. And whichever way the administration goes, that's the way uh, Mr. Quigley is going to go. That is not leadership. That is not leadership. That is not being proactive. When the administration was saying, let's cut back Social Security, let's have the chain CPI, the echo chamber is going, let's cut back on Social Security, let's have chain CPI. The administration now says we need to go and, and uh, bomb in, in Iraq and Syria, and we need to find some sympathetic uh, uh, rebels today and the future super Al Qaeda tomorrow. He said, yes, we should do that. Okay, we should do that. He voted to do that. He voted to arm uh, the so-called moderates, of which there are none in Syria. So not only is he not uh, expressing leadership, he's backing pol policies that are not good for the United States, not good for, um, um, it's, it's the wrong direction. He, um, he backs the Trans-Pacific Partnership deal. He, he said in Crane Chicago Business that somebody's going to get to the table. We should do it first. Well, oh, fabulous. We should, we should put our labor laws under an international court, under the jurisdiction of an international court, labor laws that we have reached, at, reached through a so-called democratic process. We should then turn our sovereignty over to what would be an international court. That's what the, that is what the TPP would establish. There's one already established through NAFTA. And we should, we should compete. We should allow our, our better uh, system for labor, what is, what is left of the advantages that labor unions have given us, with Vietnam, with uh, some of the highest child labor and forced labor rates in the world. He, he thinks we should get to the table and do that before somebody else does. So, uh, no, uh, not a leader, not a leader, and is not representing policies that, that are really what we actually need. Okay. And does Our he, table. you've been out in your district, does he represent the district, the constituents? You've talked to them, <laughs> and does he at all represent them? There, there's a, a, a lot of diversity in this district, and... The, the eastern part of the district, basically here, and um, uh, Lincoln Square, Lakeview, North Center, the eastern part up to about Jefferson Park, roughly Jefferson Park. 
And that's, that's where I have been more concentrating my efforts. And that is where, when I talk to people on the street and I say, you know, my platform points, stop subsidizing fossil fuel industries, let's have universal health care, let's tax Wall Street, let's have a constitutional amendment to say corporations are not people. People go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, gotcha, yep, yeah, great, fabulous. A lot of progressive thinkers, people who really do want progressive policies, primarily in the eastern part of the district. There are some in the western part of the district as well. When I've gone to the western part of the district, say at the, the, the PAL PAC that I talked about before, at the Hellenic Voters Forum, there are people who come up to me and go like, I, I agree with you, I, I think that's really great. But they're afraid, they're literally afraid, they literally whisper it to me, that's really fabulous. And they then look around. There's this lovely, lovely woman at the, uh, the, the Polish voters um, group, Joanna, who came up and, and very humbly you know, said, I, I agree with you, I agree with you. Great, <coughs> wonderful. I'm also, I'm representing for them, so they have an opportunity to vote for progressive values. The next person behind her was the guy who began screaming at me about universal health care. So, and fascism. you know, and like fascism. Here, like here yeah. in college. Yeah. So, um, so, there are progressive voters in the western part of the district. I don't want to make it sound black and white that way. But there's more in the eastern part of the district. And that's where we're really concentrating our efforts. Hey, Brown, we should get into rebuttals at yes. some point. It is time for that, and I think that we've responded to most of your questions. Uh, I haven't responded. <laughs> you responded, but thank you, Nancy. Let's thank our speaker right, one more time. Yay. There. All right. Uh, how many here have questions? Uh, rebuttals? For a few. Significant remarks to make to the rest of us. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Sure, you can. You can do it all. Just significant. Six. I think of the Republicans. It's all right. Doesn't he? Doesn't he? Five minutes and not a minute more. Or okay. less. Okay. Time for less. Just an announcement. <laughs> Don't make your announcement. Because somebody might be inspired by your remarks. Okay. All right, okay. let's uh, start with Dr. Laura. No, no, no. Start with this family. Oh. No, sir. No, no, no. You're up here. All right. Gene Harker. All right. Gene's one of us. He's a left. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank the speaker. Uh, was an excellent talk. Uh, I, I just got one thing I guess I would maybe differ slightly with the speaker. And I might have missed, my hearing isn't always good. But I think she said she lived in Lincoln Square. Uh, Lincoln Square is far from paradise. Uh, Jane Adams Senior Caucus got some good numbers because they were being gentrified out of their uh, place they were living. And uh, we fought for the uh, Martha Washington and other housing at Irving and so that one of the uh, people that I know uh, left her uh, apartment that was she was being gentrified out of and went to uh, Martha Washington uh, Apartments. Um, uh, in in uh, community organizing, we talk about no permanent allies and no permanent adversaries. Uh, the talk was of Senator Durbin. Well, I guess Senator Durbin is better than the mm -hmm. guy he's running against. But uh, I remember two instances. One when we got thrown out of his office, and the second when we got arrested in his office. <laughs> so sometimes we're in, fa in favor of what he's doing, but uh, he's oh, yeah, certainly totally. a reluctant liberal, if, if at all. Okay, it's two separate, though. Uh, the Robin Hood tax, I'm all in favor of that. That's the transaction tax, I think we ought to call it the Robin Hood tax, 
Uh, Jane Adams and your caucus is in favor of that also. We're a 501c3, so we don't endorse uh, any kind of uh, uh, candidates for any office. Uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, voting for the uh, third party. I voted a lot for third parties and I kind of resent these people who get mad because I voted for somebody like Nader. Oh, you kept uh, somebody from uh, winning office. You, uh, we could have had this rotten guy, and we instead we could have had this poor guy. And uh, now, because of you voting for a third party, uh, we didn't get that second-rate candidate. Well, I don't think I think if we're free, we ought to be able to vote for the person we want. And usually, the third party is better. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, our uh, candidate uh, uh, has said that, uh, men mentions that uh, 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 we should have a national health care. And uh, I want to mention that it takes Medicare one year to pay the doctor. Uh, I've had doctors that were clients, and they explained that to me, that every time they take care of a patient, they wait a year to get paid uh, from the government. Uh, I want to say that in Russia, it was convenient to blame the Jews until the revolution came. Now it's convenient to blame Wall Street here. Uh, Nancy uh, Wade uh, says oil is the only reason for government uh, for government to make war, but ISIS is chopping off American and British heads and promising to take over the whole Middle East and Europe and overthrow the United States. Uh, she didn't mention one word about ISIS, and I think that uh, 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 certain people in the Middle East actually do need our help to prevent this kind of thing from developing. Uh, a national health care takes money out of some of the people's pockets and puts it in other people's pockets. Uh, that is, to say the least, un-American. Uh, I want to um, say something else. I'm finished with what I had to say about that. But I want to say to everyone here that uh, I find it extremely distasteful, and I'm sure that others find it extremely distasteful, that a person continues to be punished week after week for something that took place six weeks or seven weeks ago. I think the matter should be dropped and that we don't need to keep pestering and keep punishing a, a man for a mistake that he made. I think that it should just be dropped with the understanding that in the future anyone who makes such an outburst should simply be expelled from the college for that session. Thank you and good evening. Don't know, don't know who's getting expelled from what, but um, that's amazing. <laughs> so, so, anyways, um, I wanted to rebut a couple things. First of all, um, I think Nancy Wade is an excellent candidate, and I wish I could vote for her. I'm not in Quigley's district anymore. And we call, uh, we call Quigley Squiggly Quigley because he will not say what he's going to vote for ever. <laughs> you have to have an act of God for that guy to actually commit himself to anything. 
So um, I think that it would be wonderful to have your leadership in Congress. And um, a couple things that I heard people say about national health care. First of all, the insurance companies take money out of your pockets and give it to their rich CEOs. So don't talk to me about taking money out of your pockets. The national health care... There, it is true that Medicare pays slowly. There's no question about that. Insurance sometimes doesn't pay at all. Did you know that about one-fourth of the bills that are sent to insurance companies get kicked back automatically just so that they can try to avoid to pay them? So don't give me this. I'm a physician. I know what I'm talking about. So I far prefer a single-payer uh, health care. It's not fascism. Whoever said that doesn't know the meaning of fascism. Fascism is a collusion of government and corporations, and national health care is a way that we can pay for all of our health care together and get the insurance companies out of our lives. ISIS was funded by uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Qatar, with the blessings of Obama and a CIA creation. This is a this is the perhaps maybe tenth time that we have uh, created a Frankenstein and then have said that we have to go in there and kill him. Al Qaeda was a creation of the CIA. Um, they, there's a lot of evidence that there were some uh, factions in Vietnam that were created by the CIA. So really, you have to do your homework. I think it's a really sick foreign policy, that we build up these fracking, Frankensteins and then say we have to go in after them, all for the profits of the war profiteers and, of course, the oil and natural gas companies, which is always at the center of every war. Thank you. The Nader effect and the Green Party. Really, I'm serious. I, if I have to hear it one more time, I'm going to go ballistic. I'm going postal. Nader did not keep Gore from winning. Bush stole his election in Florida. Thank you. He kept voters from voting, and they flipped votes on the electronic machines. Please do your homework. One last thing about fracking. Okay, you knew that there was a fracking thing coming on. We are still fighting fracking here in Illinois, and I would really like your help. On Monday, if you could go, uh, if you guys are on Facebook, on Frack Free Illinois on Facebook, there are 12 reps and senators that are going to decide the fate of fracking in Illinois. They're the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. And if you could call them on Monday, even leave a message, because I know it's Columbus Day, and tell them just no fracking way. We want them to prohibit the rules and send the rules back to the IDNR. The frackers are gutting the rules right now, and they are completely not going to keep us safe. And I guarantee, I, I will swear right now, that they are going to cause an earthquake in southern Illinois, and it could be a very large earthquake, which might be devastating to the people there, and could even be devastating to us. When we had the big earthquakes in the 1800s, it rang church bells in Boston. So you better believe it affected Chicago. In fact, there was a 20-foot tidal wave in Lake Michigan. So please, pick up the phone on Monday and call the uh, 12 members of the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules and tell them to throw back the rules, prohibit the rules, back to the IDNR, and this time, make sure that they protect Illinois residents and our environment. Thank you. You don't understand what I'm saying? No. Could you understand? No, no. English is my third language, so I'm oh, okay. Because I try to understand slowly. Okay. But I'll tell you Thank you, Dr. Laura. Bill my West. Bill West. Ruski, Ruski. Yeah, I think uh, some Austrian school economics would be, a very, uh, I think, about the most effective way of uh, conserving resources. There's a theory that artificially low interest rates increase consumption of those uh, items furthest in time from point of sale, like natural resources and heavy machinery. And this, this ought to be uh, very definitely, you know, this is a definite, well, you know, there's a lot of people that don't understand the difference between a truly free market 
and a supposedly free market. And the difference is a central bank and an income tax. So the income tax was more to do with uh, squeezing out small competitors who are more burdened by income tax than large ones. And I think a, a carbon tax would be entirely uh, reasonable too. Uh, I guess that's about it. <laughs> I uh, thank you for waiting. I, I was out for about 45 minutes. It was something urgent. I had to leave, and I missed uh, a lot. But uh, I, I will coming uh, back to add my two cents worth. Uh, now, because like all of you, it took me 45 years after I graduated college to realize that I was not really educated. I was put on a intellectual up for a Christian bed, like that monster in the old times in Greece we used to chop people until they were too long or stretched until yeah, if they were too short. To fit the intellectual for Christian bed, that's the analogy. So everything was between liberal and conservative. So I'm a victim of a college misinformation, disinformation, brainwashing, everything you want to call it just like all the rest of us, but it took me 45 years to figure it out. How did I figure it out? Because after 45 years, after being a history major, going to college, law school and everything, I realized nobody ever gave me one page to read about the British view of the American Revolution. So I went back and I said, you guys gave me only half of the truth, I want to refund them half of my tuition money. <laughs> Besides that, you guys made me dumber. When I was in grammar school, I was an A student. When I was in high school, I was a B student. When I was in college, I was a C student. So what does that mean? The higher up I went in education, the dumber I became. But now, I simplify things because I grew up in the communist You're okay. uh, sympathizing left in Greece. I came here when I was eight years old, but I was writing hammer and sickles all over the village the night before I got on the boat. So it's between Communism, fascism, communism, capitalism. And people like the liberals, the Green Parties, and Papandreou, Pasok, and the guy now, Syriza, the radical left in Greece, these guys are all subsidized by the bankers to uh, reduce the strength of the communist left. And the communist left in Greece is there. Maybe gets 5% of the vote, but they're still holding up the red flag. And the thing is, from little experience I've had running for Congress in 1974 in the Democratic primary, got over 8,000 votes and spent less than $500. I, in this district, 11th district, which is now the fifth, uh, I was invited by a very influential man downtown, Harvard law graduate and everything. He said, John, you got to go over and talk to so-and-so. He's a top man over here, the independent voters of Illinois. So I went over there, I met this guy, he had a real high government position. I don't want to say his name, he's, I think he's still living. But the thing is, this is 1973, 74, when I was running for the primary. He said to me, God, why don't you drop out and run in the, Democrat, in the Republican Party? I said, what the hell is this? Here's a guy, independent voters of Illinois, and he wants me to run in the Republican Party. To me, that was an awakening too. So now, the liberal, like somebody said, I didn't make this up on television, they'll throw you, you're drowning 20 feet out in the lake, but they'll throw you a 10-foot rope. That's what the liberals are. Bourgeois liberals, like most of us are. But then there is the communist left. Allende was a good, mild socialist. He died. Killed him killed democracy for 25 years. In Russia, they had Stalin. Stalin was socialismo con cojones. <laughs> you know, this is to uh, repeat a phrase which to us Balkan people, when they were bombing the Balkans for 78 days, the dirty warmongers killing people indiscriminately in 1999. On Greek television, they used to call her Madeline Halfbright. So Madeline Hepbright said the term cojones in the United Nations, so I repeat it here. So there's two different systems, capitalism and 
communism. And uh, the reason they are still trying to revive Stalin, resuscitate him, take him out of the grave and crucify him is because he stood for socialism that could fight back. Socialism with state. Socialism with military ability to defend the Nazis against the Nazis and lose 27 million people and then go and put the red flag on top of the Reichstag. So that is the difference between capitalism and socialism, or Stalinism with cojones. <laughs> Nancy, I think you'll be a great uh, candidate. I, was, uh, I like all your um, opinions on uh, universal health care and uh, energy and the gamblers on Wall Street and tax and that noise. Um, the uh, thing is, I, I wanted to clarify one quick thing when we say fossil fuels, because there's natural gas, there's oil, and there's coal. And, of course, oil is the only one that really launches a thousand ships. It's the only thing we go to war for. We don't ever have the natural gas wars or Ukraine. Uh, coal, coal wars. Well, we and don't. Bombs in Syria. We, we don't. We go to war for oil. No so, so I've been trying to figure out this ISIS thing. And, uh, you know, we're going to spend a couple more years bombing and, and Boeing and United Technologies and all of them. We're going to make a lot of money bombing Syria and Iraq. But why are we in Sy Syria? I think we're in Syria because it would look too much. So these are some of the things you're going to see. A return of nuclear energy. I mean, there is nuclear. I mean, right now it's like uh, nearly 20% of U.S. energy still comes from nuclear power stations. But they're not being written. They're not building new ones. And they're sort of looking as though they're going to phase them out. Um, and they have phased them out in Germany. You know, I mean, ridiculous. But anyway, um, nuclear power is going to make a comeback. Um, and um, fracking is going to be a huge success. The environmentalists are not going to be able to stop, stop it. They're not going to be able to cause the deaths of millions of third world babies, as they would like. Um, and um, Research into renewable energy is fine, and it will go on. And eventually, 50, 100 years from now, it may actually work in an economically viable way. I mean, it, could, it could work now in a, a small supplementary way. But there's a diff you have a different attitude to it if you realize it's a small supplementary thing and not the main thing. You've got to have the backup of the main source of power, and that's nuclear or fossil fuels. Mike, please, okay. burning here. You know, um, there's seven billion people in the world now. There's one billion cars now. There's one million jet aircraft in constant operation. Your charts here, you know, in 1940, I think there were 10 million cars and there were one billion people on the planet. So I think it's presumptuous of the deniers, the uh, skeptics, the catastrophists uh, to predict. And, um, uh, you know, there's going to be two billion cars soon, and there's going to be two billion jet, air, jet aircraft. The, uh, there's going to be a lot of carbon being emitted. So, are you saying that burn, baby, burn as much as we can? Let's party on, drill, baby, drill. And the, you, I think you know, I'm a, I'm a God-fearing man. I think you sh we should be thinking about it. And you're saying it's, uh, you know, the hell with it. You know, I, what was causing CO2 back years ago? Forest fires, a volcano or two? Nothing. You know, what, what was, you know, what? Now all of a sudden we're going to have two billion cars because the Chinese, the Indians, all the other rest are going to want to have that. And they're going to burn a lot of oil. So, you know, what was causing CO2 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Virtually nothing. Okay, well, I mean, uh, let me just, okay, uh, there's, there's, two, there's two things here, really. Let me just fill you in on, some, uh, on the basic science of CO2. Um, what you have to understand is that that 400 parts per million by volume is the outcome of huge natural forces, mostly natural forces. There are 
huge natural forces that are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Like Millions of tons every hour. Na purely natural forces. And there, is, there are huge natural forces that are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But we're and these ruining two, all our forests. And, and these, right? two, these, two, <laughs> these two things, there's huge natural forces are <coughs> creating CO2 and there are huge natural forces taking CO2 away. That's, even if human beings disappeared, that would be true. Uh, <clears throat> now, the, the huge natural, actually I should say one huge natural force that is taking CO2 out, photosynthesis. All green plants convert, they take carbon dioxide and sunlight, and they make cellulose, which is what keeps us regular. They make sugar and starch, which is what makes us overweight. And they make a little bit, each one makes a little bit of O2, oxygen gas, which enables us to breathe. That's what plants do. Every plant all over the world is working hard all the time to do that. Right? So photosynthesis is taking carbon dioxide out in huge quantities. Billions of gigatons per year taking carbon dioxide out. Uh, natural processes that are a bit more obscure and much less is known about, but they're mainly the activities of animals, insects, uh, microbes, um, are adding CO2. In fact, and if you look at annual emissions of CO2 right now, 4% are human, the other 96% are natural. Right? So, <clears throat> so that's what you have to understand, that the 400 ppmv of CO2 is an outcome, I was going to say equilibrium, but that's not quite right, it's an outcome of these two huge colossal natural forces with a little bit of human added on the one side. Uh, but of course, the, the, the human addition doesn't automatically translate into more CO2 in the atmosphere because what it does is it stimulates plant growth. As more plants, they take CO2 out and add O2, right? So, so that's something you have to understand. Now, uh, I, I see nothing wrong with 10 million people all driving two, two SUVs. Nothing at all. Uh, carbon dioxide enriches the atmosphere. It's great. Uh, now, I would say this, however. If you do have this general outlook, which I can understand, um, that many people have. Um, according to demographers, mm -hmm. and like all other branches of science, they're fallible, uh, the world population is going to stop growing in 2070. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, and uh, they've always been, so far, their predictions have always been overtaken. In other words, it's, it's, they keep bringing it closer because the birth rate is collapsing everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. almost everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so one of the, one of the benefits, if you think that way, one of the benefits of economic growth is that it causes the birth rate to collapse more rapidly. Okay. Right? So the world's population will stop growing and start declining sooner if we have rapid economic growth. Yep. So in the long term, over a couple of centuries, the, one, the biggest predictor of human contribution to carbon dioxide is just population, just simply population. Um, so, um, if that's the way you're thinking, then w what science tells us is rapid economic growth will cause uh, the, the, Earth, the world's human population to begin to decline sooner. Um, and so therefore, by the end of this century, the world's human population will be declining slowly, uh, and therefore the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide ahead, other things being equal, will be declining as well. But we'll have twice as many planes and cars. That Butler in the Carina. Yeah, uh, I am uh, one of the journalists that you uh, alluded to earlier who liked a uh, quick headline and a good lead paragraph. But seriously, are you saying that uh, because of the fact we are seeing an increase in respiratory diseases in highly industrialized places, such as China, uh, uh, 
such as, uh, uh, well, it used to be true in parts of Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, are you saying no. that uh, this is a, pollution is a very good way of population control, and that if we have enough pollution, it'll no longer be necessary to use the little pink pill? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I just need, I, what I'm saying is that, first of all, the respiratory di diseases are not being caused by carbon dioxide. They're being caused by sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other things, and dust, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, and, and despite that, I mean, uh, uh, two of my kids recently went to um, China with the youth orchestra, and uh, they said in certain places you can't, you can't go out without a mask, basically. It's, it, it's that bad. But, you know, despite that, the Chinese population is gaining in health and vigor and longevity all the time, right now. I mean, this is a huge improvement in living standards overall. No, uh, I did, I, I, all emissions of different substances are not the same. Right? Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. It enriches the atmosphere. It makes plants grow. It's great. Uh, but I agree that something should be done. We could have a separate discussion about exactly what. Something should be done to curb all kinds of pollutants, including those that are making it hard to breathe in China. Uh, so, I, so that's the thing. All substances emitted by human history are not the same. Yeah, but we'll see it's coal and oil. All right. Yes, Karina, and then... Uh, Dennis yeah. Nelson. What else? Uh, are we at peak oil? <coughs> is, is the supply of uh, oil finite? Are we at peak oil? When will <coughs> oil run out? Food. Um, actually, this is something I haven't looked at for quite some time, but my understanding is from people who've been looking at it recently is that it's going to last for centuries. And of course, fracking is the big breakthrough here. I mean, you know, <coughs> there's enormous, enormous quantities of the stuff. It, it just, and the, we've known about this for a long time. I, when I was a kid, I remember reading about uh, oil shale and uh, that it was too expensive to get out. And um, it's just that technological advance has changed things. Um, so, um, no, I don't think, you know, um, industry changes, and, um, you know, in, I, I always think of the, in the 19th century where people projected that if cities went on growing the way they were, then all cities would be 10 feet deep in horse shit, right? <laughs> because that was an extrapolation. They, uh, in, in, uh, in, I don't know about in, yeah, I think it's true in the United States, but in Britain, people refer to it as mud. When people talk about mud in the streets, what they meant is it was several inches of horseshit. Um, and, um, uh, you know, um, horse-drawn horse conveyances didn't go out of fashion because the horseshit got too deep. We, we just moved, we moved beyond that and invented this wonderful thing it's called the car, the automobile. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so I think that um, nuclear and other sources uh, will, and also some of these renewable sources that I was belittling, but they will come into their own eventually with a lot of research. Um, <clears throat> uh, they will, uh, you see, what, what, would, what would happen if we actually started to run out of oil is the price of oil would go up. I, and I don't mean just the way it goes up now, I mean inflation adjusted. The price of oil now, adjusting for inflation, is much, much lower than it was 60, 70 years ago. Much lower. That's, that means it's less scarce now than it was then. Um, and <clears throat> so, if, what would actually happen is, uh, if there was any chance whatsoever that we might start to run out of oil, is the price of oil would start to rise slowly and remorselessly and it would make these alternatives much more attractive and people would put more funds into research spontaneously to develop some of these alternatives. So I don't, I don't see peak oil, I just think that's sort of confused, bemuddled thinking. Uh, uh, thanks for coming this evening. Um, my question pertains to this article by Stephen Coonan that you, mm -hmm. from the uh, Wall Street Journal that you handed out that I was familiar with before I came here this, uh, this evening. Uh, isn't uncertainty a major reason why climate action is so urgent? You have to explain that. That's what he says in the article. We are very far from the knowledge needed to make good climate policy. There's so many uncertainties that we really can't do anything. 
and uh, I looked stuff up on uh, Joseph Rom's climate blog, the climate progress, where I always go to, and he and he and other climate uh, scientists and experts seem to say that the opposite is true, that because the remaining uncertainties in climate science do not undermine the case for strong action. In fact, we we need, you know, because we have these uncertainties, like uh, for example, like weather and that sort of thing on a local and regional level, that this is even more of a call of action instead of sticking uh, your your heads in the sand, and that's what you and Kunin seem to be saying right now. Well, um, one point that's sometimes overlooked here is that when a climate scientist starts talking about public policy, he's leaving climate science behind, and he's moving into an area where he's no better qualified to talk than you or I. Right. Public policy doesn't auto public policy doesn't flow from climate science, right? Uh, when somebody says, "Oh, uh, the risks are so great, we better do something," that's not climate science. That's politics. That's economics. Um, and um, there have been econometric studies done. Of the, uh, you know, we're talking here about something really quite simple: the a general warming. What would what will ha what would happen if if the world's uh, temperature got a bit warmer. Um, and there have been econometric studies done of this. Um, one of them by a guy named Toll, T-O-L. Uh, and, uh, you know, he came out with, he's done a lot of work on this, and he's, he buys completely, because he's not a climate scientist, he's an economist who's studying the effects of, of um, these impacts. Um, he buy, he he's a, buys completely the majority IPCC view, right? Um, but he says that, based on, on his calculations, uh, that are very thorough, uh, that warming will be a benefit for, the, for two, two degrees, up to two degrees warming, will be a benefit, right? That's what Toll, it's not in that article. Toll says that. You can, I can give, send you uh, citations to his work and so on. Um, so, uh, and then after, after two degrees, it will, he, according to Toll, it will start to get worse. Um, so, um, the idea that because something's uncertain it calls for immediate drastic action is a strange thing to me. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that there's a lot of, un in my mind there's not a lot of uncertainty about whether it's better to be warmer or cold. I'm in favor of it being warmer. Right? Um, human beings are tropical animals. Uh, you know, they flourish when it gets warmer. Uh, when, the, when the last glaciation ended, like 15,000, 12,000 years ago, that was when human beings separated themselves from the beasts. That's when they started to do all these wonderful things, making pottery, making t uh, elaborate tools and so on. That's when they started expanding everywhere. Um, we are tropical animals. We can't live outside the tropics without artificial aids, clothing to keep heat close to our surface buildings to keep heat uh, more broadly, and fire to, keep, to warm things up. Without those three things, we're dead outside the tropics. We have to take the tropics with us wherever we go. We're tropical animals. Um, and to me, the, you know, this is something everybody really acknowledges. If people go to the Caribbean or something like that where it's very warm, um, <clears throat> what do they say spontaneously? They say, this is paradise. That's what everybody says, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, it's true that those are the conditions best for human beings. So I'm, I'm in favor of more warming than two degrees, actually. That's my <laughs> dirty little secret. But, um, uh, I, you know, now, the rapidity with which any change occurs poses problems of adjustment. Um, so one of the consequences of warming is rising sea level. Uh, the sea level has been... So hundreds of meters high, or over 100 meters higher than it is today. It's also been a lot lower, so that you can walk from Alaska to, uh, to Siberia, and not just see it as, uh, as what's a Sarah Palin play? She could, um, you know, so, um, you, you, you know, uh, so that's, that, if you have a seafront property, you might be worried by rising sea level. On the other hand, warmer, warming and rising sea level means that Vast acres, millions of billions of acres of land in Russia, Canada, Alaska, northern China, uh, which are now pretty useless, become useful. 
Uh, so actual land area grows with rising sea level. A youth strength, paradoxical though it may seem. So um, in broad terms, I'd li I like the idea of warming. I think it's great. Uh, if, we, if, if carbon dioxide really was a control knob, I would say, turn up that control knob, let's get it warmer. Okay. Um, but sudden change can be uh, inconvenient for a lot of people. So what, we, what would be best would be gradual change and permanent change. All right. Real quick. Right. The real you over here. Okay, real quick. Uh, we, it's getting to be about 8.15. I'd like to try to close out the question session in about 10 minutes. So, you know, we got all like four right, or five people. Yes. I, first of all, thank you so much for finally nailing the Nazi environmentalist for their secret plan to want to kill children and keep the poor in, in total destitution. I've suspected this for years, and thank you for putting words to that effect. Um, and I, I was thinking as you were talking about the contributions to greenhouse gases. I think methane is one of the big ones. I was thinking about that because animals produce it, and I was wondering what your view of animal production of methane was. Well, um, I didn't bring the numbers with me, but methane is even smaller than carbon dioxide. Uh, the biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor. The biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor, let's be clear about that. And you remember when I say that, I mean water vapor. Um, uh, that's, that is the, the, the greenhouse gas par excellence. And the, in fact, the theory of the catastrophes, the theory they have as to why there would be this great amplification, is what they say is this. If you, increase, if you add carbon dioxide, you cause warming, the warming will cause more water vapor, which will then cause more warming, and you'll get runaway warming, right? That's their, their argument. Um, and, of course, the, one of the rebuttals of this is that throughout history, or throughout prehistory, actually, mainly, or a little bit throughout history, it's been warmer, and that hasn't happened. Um, uh, and, and when you add carbon dioxide, you not only add water vapor. It's true that if, you add car if it gets warmer, if it gets warmer, it will be... The, the air will get more moist. Um, so, All right. so um, okay. Okay. David Tucker. Yes, you say global rise. You say the rising of of the sea levels is good for some countries. What about places like the Maldives? Yeah. No. I. I, I mean. I, I agree. There's great problems of adjustment. And and. Uh, but I mean. Look. I don't th unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see two degrees warming. I think we're going to see, uh, we, I don't think we'll see another degree of warming. Uh, and remember that, remember that so far, the catastrophists have always been wrong in their predictions. Always, every time. You know, when James Hansen went before Congress in 1988 and made these predictions, they've all, they've all you know, he gave several predictions. He, he said, if... We have business as usual, continued growth of emissions. Uh, then we'll have this amount of warming. And it, he was delivering this during a heat wave in Washington. And so it carried a lot of conviction because people are influenced by uh, accidental circumstances. And then if we mitigate it somewhat by cutting down on emissions, then it's going to be this. And if we make a, a huge cut in emissions, then it's going to be this. Right? Well, actually, the emissions were way above the business as usual projection. The actual temperature is way below his bottom projection. And that's the beginning of the whole succession. They've always been wrong. They've always predicted greater warming than has occurred. Um, and they, they, didn't, they didn't say, you know, now that you, the way you read some people, it's, it's, they, you know, they thought that they allowed for the possibility that there would be things like the floor. No, they didn't. They wrote their predictions ruled that out. Uh, now, where, where the predictions are not absolutely wrong, they gave a range of probabilities. And in those cases, you find that if they're not absolutely outside the range, the actual outcome is at the bottom end. It's never near the center of their projections. So, uh, so basically, they've always been wrong. And, um, uh, you know, so uh, I don't expect these catastrophic uh, effects to occur. Now, if, with warming, there will be, there has been, you know, for the past 200 years, there has been a, a rise of sea level. 
you know, it, it's been rising by a, a, a very small amount, a few millimeters a year, right? Um, and um, uh, I, I expect that if warming continues, that will go on. If warming is reversed, as might happen soon, um, that will be put into reverse. Um, and, but it is true that um, <clears throat> any kind of climate change, colder or warmer, uh, will greatly inconvenience some people. Um, or even staying the same will, will inconvenience some people. Uh, so, yes, uh, but it will benefit other people. I mean, there are, there are losers yeah. and gainers. Yeah, like massive droughts. Yeah, massive droughts. Ilyana, can you say it quickly? Yeah, very quick. So, so my my question is, uh, if in China, uh, every city they wear mask, and what government do about it, or they don't do nothing? Oh, well, it's not every city. Because I saw in the Google, all in China's major city they wear mask. Then why and what government? Government not helping to, with this dilemma? No. Um, it's not every city. Um, and you must remember that certain parts, China is a big place, and some parts of China um, have not seen much urbanization and much, much uh, industrialization. Uh, on the other hand, the parts that have have seen this absolutely spectacular um, uh, growth. Um, what's the government doing about it? I don't know what the government's doing about it, if anything. I mean, the government seems to be composed, as far as I can tell, I haven't studied this in depth, but it seems to be composed of, of um, people who have absorbed Western education, either immediately by going abroad or by people who have gone abroad teaching them. Um, and they have decided that the best way to develop the country is laissez-faire, so they're not interfering uh, uh, in... Um, in industry, um, and of course the fact that there is no democracy uh, means that there are no pressure groups able to lobby successfully to bring in these measures. So, right for the, which, and now the fact that they can't bring in these measures, you can have one or two views about, but it is certainly conducive to industrialization, but it's not every city in China, it's, a, it's certainly not every city. All right, Andreas? Yeah. I remember I not too long ago, reports about large sections of the south of the po south south polar ice sheet breaking off and floating away i remember um video movies of greenland ice cap melting and running into the sea and i remember going up to glacier national park in montana and having people who saw the glacier just within their lifetime, tell me how it's shrunking back. And I remember people who went up to Alaska in cruise boats who see the glaciers there and are told that only 20 years ago, it was several miles, you know, it has shrunk several miles since then. How do you calm my fear that this is not melting ice everywhere? Well, there's different ways to answer that, but I mean, let, let's get a few things straight. Antarctic ice has been growing continuously and is now at the highest level ever recorded. Um, there is a little bit of Antarctica called the Antarctic Peninsula that comes way out, where there has been a loss of ice. But the, uh, Antarctica, the huge continent, it's thicker, it's stronger, it's greater than it's ever been. I mean, in recorded. I mean, not, it's not greater than it's been in, human, in looking at the proxy record. But in terms of observation by humans who've been studying it, it's, it's been growing. So um, in the last couple of years, Arctic ice has started to reconstitute. You see, these are cyclical processes. Um, and so even when Arctic ice was shrinking, world ice was constant because Antarctic ice was growing. Um, so that's that's part of it, but but you know these things are um, these things are the, the cyclical trends, and there have been there have been periods even in human history where you know there was a northwest passage where you could sail through, which is blocked now by ice, 
Uh, there, was the, the, there was the Norse colonization of Greenland, where they could sail right round Greenland, because the northern part was not frozen. Um, that was in the medieval warm period. Um, and um, the, 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 then there's the long-term view, I'm afraid, of the thousands of years, where glaciers grow and eventually... When, when I say that in the glaciation, Chicago will be under several miles of ice, you have to understand that begins with glaciers. Glaciers grow and spread, and then eventually they join up, and then eventually they take over the land, and there's nothing but a huge ice thing there. And most of the glaciers that we're talking about shrinking in the last few hundred years, uh, they're relatively new glaciers. They were only formed in the last couple of thousand years. There were, there were no, you know, there was, and one of the things that occasionally, if you look at these newspaper reports about glaciers melting, one of the things that Occasionally, they, they, because it makes a, a nice story for the reporter, it's mentioned, uh, but it's more or less uniform, is that as these glaciers melt, what do they find? They uncover human habitations. They uncover houses, as well as forests, uh, that, are, that, that have been covered up by, the, by, by these glaciers in the last couple of thousand years. So, um, <clears throat> there, will, there will be ups and downs. You know, when, when we went into the last glaciation, like over 100,000 years ago, uh, there was a long period where global temperatures were falling. But there were often periods of a couple of hundred years where they were, where, where they were rising. So people around at that time, they were always getting warmer. Well, they didn't because these things are never noticeable anyway, uh, except with special instruments. But if they'd been that acutely observant, they might have said that. Um, but... Um, you know, so you are going to get, over the next few thousand years, you're going to get occasional episodes of two or three hundred years where it gets warmer, ice melts, glaciers shrink, uh, and that's going to be reversed because we're going into a new glaciation. It's inevitable, nothing can stop it. Um, and the, the glaciers will grow again. Uh, so uh, I, hope, I, I wish I could make the glaciers go away completely. I wish I could melt all the ice. And the Earth used to be like that for millions of years before 65 million years ago, uh, where there was no ice anywhere. Um, but uh, we're now in an ice age, and uh, we have glaciers with us all the time. Um, it's very unfortunate, but there they are. They're not going to go away. All right. Uh, L.T. Anderson, uh, then uh, Jim Fiducci. Then that will be the last <coughs> question, Brom. I have uh, just two, two quick things to ask. Uh, are you uh, currently working, or are you retired? That's one question. Uh, if you're working for somebody, uh, I'd like. Can you tell me what you do for a living? And the other thing is, what country or countries have you lived in during the last 20 years? Well, um, I work as an editor for a book publishing company. That's my job. Uh, I haven't retired, and I don't think I'll ever be able to afford to retire. Um, which is a shame because I like to write, and uh, I would spend my time writing if I could retire. But. Um, so that's what I do for a living. I edit books. Um, and um, uh, the only countries I've lived in for any length of time are uh, the UK and the USA. How much time in the USA the last few years? Last 30 years. Last 30 years here in the yes. USA? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I take it that you discount the uh, various um, feedback loops involving methane, such as flat rate. Yeah, this is part of climate sensitivity, right? I mean, we're talking about the, the, all the possible feedbacks. That's one. I mean, that's not the one the catastrophes usually place the most emphasis on, but it has been, um, it has been discussed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, basically, it seems to me, um, from what I've read and from the t skeptical climate scientists I've talked to and read about, um, this, what, and what we call skeptical here means skeptical about catastrophism, right? It doesn't mean skeptical in the ancient Greek sense. Um, uh, are not, they're not actually skeptics. They have a definite point of view. And, the point of, and their point of view is that climate sensitivity is low. Um, and that um, uh, raising CO2 levels is not going to cause... Uh, a runaway process by any of these different methods that have been suggested, and the arguments for that are partly historical, 
Uh, now they're being su they're being supplemented by detailed studies. Right. Right. And that, that's one thing, by the way, uh, I ought to mention there. Um, if you're interested in any area of science, you can get hold of the papers in that area that are coming out all the time, every week, thousands of them. Um, in climate science, so climate science, remember, is a newly cobbled together discipline. It didn't exist 50 years ago. There were, meteor there were chairs of meteorology, there were atmospheric physicists, and there were geologists and different people, but climate science has been, is an immature science that's been put together recently. Um, and in that area of climate science, um, it's not that there's a constant pitched argument between catastrophists and skeptics. Most of the evidence for the skeptical position comes from people who pay lip service to catastrophism. This is, this is what's actually, what actually happens. Uh, that somebody will write, do a study, the results will be a bit inconvenient for, catast for the catastrophist orthodoxy. They will put a few lines in their, in their paper saying, but this doesn't, of course we accept catastrophism, um, and um, uh, we, we don't suggest that this contradicts it. However, here are our results. Uh, and the skeptics read these papers, and they use these results for their arguments, because, I mean, a, a, a classic example, was um, the paper that came out last year from Wunsch and Heimbach. Um, Wunsch, uh, these are the two, are uh, probably the two most eminent ocean scientists in the world. Uh, Wunsch is at MIT, Heimbach is at Harvard. Uh, that paper that came out last year, uh, basically what it said was, I'm greatly simplifying it, I urge you to get hold of it and read the paper yourself. But what it actually said was, you see, when the pores started, the pores of, uh, of uh, the temp surface temperature had not risen, the, all kinds of arguments came back from the catastrophes to explain this. And, but the most popular is, the heat is hiding in the oceans. Right? This is, that's the most popular one. Um, actually, 20 years ago, skeptical climate scientists were saying we shouldn't pay so much attention to these surface temperatures. Because... The oceans are so important, and that was just scoffed at and dismissed by the, by the catastrophists because they had a rising trend of surface temperatures. Uh, now they've got the pores, they're casting around in, in a panic for something that will rescue their theory. And, one of the, and the most popular one, the one they've settled on, most of them, is that it's, the heat is hiding in the oceans. Well, this paper that came out last year from um, Wunsch and Heimbach, um, both Americans, despite their very German name, uh, um, uh, it basically says the oceans are getting colder. Uh, I mean, th th there's tremendous oversimplification. Just read the paper. But that's what it says. The oceans are getting colder. Um, and um, uh, there's a, a couple of lines in their paper where they, say, where they pay lip service to the, um, to the catastrophist position. You see, now, one should Heimbach study the oceans but they're not going to make any waves. Okay. All right, Brom, at this point, it's about 8.30-something. Yes. We need to get into the rebuttal period fairly uh, quickly. Ah, yes. Uh, That's, well, let's... Right, let's uh, you'll have to start with uh, Bill Went and the rebuttal period. Okay? Uh, how many... Uh, you can have the first rebuttal. Uh, how many rebutters do we have tonight? <clears throat> One, two... Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, nine. We can probably go about four minutes each. Uh, some probably won't use the full amount of time. David, you'll get the final word as yeah. usual. We'll probably go a little past nine, but let's try to respect the restaurant. Um, let's get to it. I've got timer in hand. Let's thank our speaker, David Ramsey, one more time. If you want to rebut, get up there and uh, you got four minutes. Uh, there's kind of a middle ground on uh, 
It's a question. People that don't, who think there's something to the argument, I think it's uh, greatly exaggerated. Uh, I think there are ways of dealing with global warming. Now, for some years I've advocated a return of steam locomotives for fast, heavy freight trains. And, uh, uh, you know, I might uh, seem like an environmental disaster, but I think the fuels could be uh, industrial hemp, a form of tobacco, or a thorium size, a truck size thorium reactor. Uh, Now, the uh, acid rain was not a problem until about 10 years after steam locomotives disappeared. So it, uh, it wouldn't be that problem. Uh, yeah, and the Rockefellers just announced recently that they're not going to invest any more in fossil fuels. No, well, I think that's. Oh, well, you, you and you had. Uh, you know, you kind of got a drill, baby, drill attitude too. Yeah, uh, you, know, you kind of think the. Uh, Economy is a bottle when it's actually a cow. Uh, no, I don't know. Thanks, Bill. That was a good point by Bill. Yeah, the Rockefellers divested themselves of any relationship with oil. And the Rockefellers are oil. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's who Exxon is now in Standard Oil. You know, I almost wish this stuff wasn't called climate change or global warming because this is a bigger issue. I wish it was called carbon costs or something like that. I think what it comes down to is is it better that we burn more oil or burn less or coal? I think we're getting a handle on coal, but I think most people would think logically and rationally that it's probably better off if we burn less oil going forward because there's going to be all these cars and planes and stuff. So, um, so I think when I to to, to when I chime to this carbon cost things, like, I don't, I think this ISIS is another oil war. I just don't see a couple Americans getting killed that we're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars in the next few years again in Iraq. I know Halliburton and the oil companies put a lot of money in Iraq building up the infrastructure for oil. But I see this as a third oil war after Kuwait and uh, after the WMDs in Iraq or whatever Bush and Cheney thought up. So, like I say, I think this is a more an issue of carbon costs and climate change. I don't, I don't really, I'm not crazy about, I mean, I haven't even made up my mind on climate stuff. It's too hard for me to think about. Um, okay, so, oh, and by the way, top 10 companies in the world are either, five of them are either making cars or making oil. So who do you think runs the world? Oil companies. So that's why we'll probably always have military in the Middle East for oil. As much as everybody thinks we're getting a lot of tar sands and oil shale out there, we still are hugely dependent on Middle East oil. And the world is. Um... So, yeah, you know, we, we talked a little bit. Oh, oh, I wanted to make a point. 
I think one of the worst things from what I've heard and understood about climate change is that massive droughts could be in the future. And that's a lot more serious than people think. If we can't grow corn or soybeans or other agriculture crops in the world, that could be a real huge, huge issue. <laughs> I mean, we still uh, need to eat. Okay, time. That's it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay. Okay, David, thanks for your presentation, but quite frankly, we really should hear about attention reality check needed and the delusion that human-made climate disruption doesn't exist except the sound science that it, that it does. Just like a kid riding a bicycle, planet Earth needs a safety helmet. I'm a longtime free speech advocate. For example, I've submitted online comments in support of internet neutrality to the Federal Communications Commission and President Barack Obama, free and open internet. But David acts like the de facto mouthpiece for a well-orchestrated, deceptively um, deliberately deceptive disinformation, misinformation campaign funded by the large fossil fuelish, or you could also say fossil foolish polluters. They only want to deny the scientific consensus and reality behind human-caused climate disruption and delay any immediate and meaningful national, international actions to deal with it. That's why I call them climate deniers, delayers. Their purpose is to deliberately create doubt, confusion, and inaction. This is a morally, ethically bankrupt, unscientific, ideologically driven campaign. It is well documented in books like Merchants of Doubt, Climate Cover-Up, Science is a Contact Sport, The Heat is On, Behind the Curve, and The Hockey Stick and The Climate Wars. And I particularly want to discuss the last book that I have here in my hand by climate scientist Dr. Michael Mann at Penn State University. The Hockey Stick Graph that uh, David alluded to in his presentation has especially been attacked by the climate deniers delayers. It shows a dramatic upward spike in the average surface temperature of the earth that directly coincides with our modern industrialization and inefficient burning of fossil fuels. Rather than being totally discredited or broken as uh, David has maintained, the hockey stick graph has been reaffirmed by the National Academy of Sciences, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and over 12 independent peer-reviewed scientific studies. But you'll never hear that from David. Now it takes considerable time and effort for Dr. Mann and his colleagues to respond point by point to the fabricated, bogus, flawed, and inaccurate criticisms from climate deniers to layers. You can tell how effective the climate scientists are by how their case is being attacked by the climate deniers to layers. Now, David, cherry pick a couple examples, and I don't agree with that kind of behavior where people have said, oh, well, the, you know, the climate deniers to layers should be shot, blah, blah, blah. But that's not the real important issue. The more important issue is that the much more important thing is that climate scientists are now being personally harassed and intimidated. <coughs> David didn't mention anything about that. And, and they are fighting back. Michael Mann has filed a defamation lawsuit against the right-wing National Review. I refer to this well-written viewpoint by Gene Lyons entitled Climate Change Deniers Resort to Character Attacks that appeared in the Chicago Sun-Times Saturday, August uh, 16th of this year. Climate deniers delayers such as TV commentators in the National Review, they're going to rant and rave about their right for free speech. But do they have the so-called right to poison the airwaves and print media with slanderous and libelous politically motivated <coughs> smears against the professional integrity and private character of a prominent climate scientist like Dr. Mann. This is at the same time that the big fossil fuelish polluters are poisoning our atmosphere. Now, I'm a longtime participant here at the college. I understand that the college practices free speech and respect to contrarian points of view. But I think in this case, I'm now re recommending that the, co the college practices responsible speech when it comes to the subject of human-caused climate disruption. I think we would be we, much better spending time discussing climate policy. I would be willing to help set that up. Okay. This is because there is no actual debate over climate science. David's junk science-filled 
presentation merely shows that climate deniers to layers really don't have a leg to stand on. We're really behind the eight ball, the climate eight ball, and we need to move forward pronto with constructive solutions for mitigation, which is our top priority, and adaptation, which is our second priority. Otherwise, the college should schedule somebody from the International Flat Earth Society, which claims that satellite photographs taken of our planet are faked, or a representative from the tobacco industry, which claims that secondhand smoke is harmless. I'm ending my rebuttal on a positive note. We can prevent the worst effects of climate disruption. We can succeed in fully implementing technically and economically feasible non-nuclear energy and non-fossil fuel strategies around the world by 2050. Only energy efficiency and micropower, which consists of cogeneration appropriate <laughs> renewables, can make the larger scale and deeper, meaningful and timely cuts in our carbon pollution. This will be much more preferable in protecting our public health, maintaining our ecological health, enhancing our economic well-being, and strengthening our energy security. Thanks a lot. Okay. We did allow uh, David to go an extra couple minutes. They requested a couple minutes. Dennis. Dennis, I'm sorry. Dennis. So I'm going to keep my rebuttal very short and very sweet. You know, it, it is one thing that there is a solution to Dennis's dilemma and our speaker's dilemma. And that, my friend, is the widespread adaptation of the newer Generation 4 thorium-based molten salt reactors. We're not going to do it by getting our fossil fuel economy, keeping it going in perpetuity. I've spoken on this topic in the past, and as I'm looking more and more into the future, when you consider the aspects of an equation, E equals MC squared. We're kind of crazy to be using even chemical reactions for our modern industrial society. I also agree with David that our modern, in the form of the uh, heavy water reactors that we use today, are inherently dangerous, which is why we need innovation in the field. And even with David Ramsey, uh, with, with our speaker's proposals on, on population, which I agree with. All of us can agree that clean, cheap energy is what's going to be the best way to develop this planet, the best way forward to move this planet, and frankly, the only way I can see that being done is through the implementation of thorium-based molten salt reactors. I'm not the only one who agrees here. China's already got 200 people working on the problem, and if we don't, we, they might be the next, you think we had trouble with Middle East oil? Wait until we start having trouble with, with Chinese thorium-based reactors. What are we going to do? <laughs> thorium-based molten salt reactors. Sounds kind of appetizing to me. <laughs> Makes me think of maybe popcorn or what you see down at the bottom of the popcorn. Anyway, uh, uh, Mr. Bolger, Tim Bolger talks about uh, thorium based molten salt reactors, and uh, I think that the free market will handle the whole thing perfectly because we have so many people uh, involved in so many different mediums of energy that we will let the best one prevail and that will be determined by the free market. But on the other hand, when we look at what this uh, other gentleman talked about just before Jim, uh, I believe his name was Dennis, and he's emphatically stating that we're going to definitely have heavy duty global warning, warming, then I think in that case, for all of you people who believe that, 
then I think that the best thing to do is to go to South Dakota, North Dakota, Michigan, uh, even Alaska. Uh, in most of those places, like Michigan, it goes down to 40, 45 below in the wintertime. In uh, North, South and North Dakota, it goes down to, I think, 60 below in the wintertime. Well, I suggest you go there and buy as much land as you can because with global warming, these areas are going to become more akin to Florida or Louisiana, <laughs> where there'll be prime property for vacation spots and prime property for farming. You'll get rich beyond your wildest dreams simply by investing in cheap raw land in these places that the wintertime tears up. And that's about all I got to say. Yeah. Next. Okay, Andy. <laughs> Thank you for giving a presentation tonight. There was an excellent summary of one side of a so-called debate in America and the world. Um, there's a quote in this book, This Changes Everything. The quote is, as soon as climate deniers admit the climate change is real, then the central, they will lose the central ideological battle of our time. One, one climate de denier from one of the big corporations finally admitted, he said, climate, climate change is obviously real and it's obviously caused to a significant extent by people. I really don't think there's room for any debate on either of these points anymore. So now, to slow down the spread, the transition away from trillions of dollars worth of fossil fuels that are still in the ground and planning to be burned, consumed, whatever, we have to create doubt. That's what that book, Merchants of Doubt, talks about. People give uh, tremendous presentations saying that uh, there's doubt. And the media, the media present this like a debate. They presented the tobacco debate 20 years after the science was solid and there was no debate at all. But they allowed scientists to stand at a podium and say, oh yeah, there's still a debate. Secondhand smoke is not, uh, the evidence is not all in. We're still doing research. Well, as long as you're still doing research, uh, you know, the Flat Earth Society is still doing research, but the rest of us have gone with the Ball Earth evidence <laughs> because the database on the Ball Earth side is pretty big. Uh, three quick points. Living in America for the last 30 years and not knowing about the disaster of nuclear power or the disaster at Fukushima or the disaster at Three Mile Island or Chernobyl, it shows a clear lack of grasp on the reality of that situation. <laughs> um, being, not living in a monastery somewhere with no radio, television, or anything else, and living out in the real world with the rest of us, and being able to claim that fracking is a huge success, <laughs> when the reality is that it's a disaster of biblical proportions, is again a lack of grasp on reality just living in a bubble. I've talked about this, uh, we're in our 37th year of Project Censored putting out the book <laughs> Censored News. It shows how me the media in America and a lot of book publishers run a two-pronged process. You promote the myth on all channels 24-7 and you simultaneously run a blackout on the scientists that are publishing the reality, the database. Renewable, to say that renewable energy is 50 to 100 years in the future uh, toward making any meaningful contribution, 
is exactly the opposite of the reality that Amory Lovins was quoting to people in 1988 in his World Travels. They said we're trying to develop a new motor or some efficient thing. He would point out that what you're trying to develop is already being used and sold in this country. It's been mass produced for four years. We are in the middle of an economic and energy efficiency global revolution. Nobody is talking about shutting down uh, in an industry, uh, you know, shutting down capitalism or anything else. They're talking about changing the system to something other than billionaires gone wild. That's what we have today. Billionaires gone wild. We're shoveling money to the owners of these billionaire-owned companies in, in amounts that have never been seen in recorded history. 150 million Americans now are insecure, uh, semi-employed, underemployed, half the country. I mean, it's, uh, and the media has just been lying to us about this. Oh, oh, Graham, he said lying. He I, said I, lying. Said, I said the media. I didn't say any particular person. I said uh, some... some Pat Butler's there. He insulted Pat Butler. Let me finish, please. Check him out. And uh, the last point, um, they're not talking about, they're not really, the climate scientists aren't worried about a, a one or two degree rise per se. What they're worried about is all the studies that show that methane is uh, 15, 20, 30 times worse going into the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. They're referring to it as a methane burp that would cause the planet to warm up 10 or 12 degrees in a decade. And that would be it for 97% of uh, species on Earth. So uh, the science is overwhelmingly accepted by 99. They're, they're claiming all the studies are claiming about 97% of client scientists are on the what uh, David referred to as the catastrophic side in projections, and only 3% are claiming that it's not a problem. So uh, keep reading, everybody. Thank you. Okay, he's done. Brown. How come he gets to call people liars, Brown? That <laughs> Butler's a media guy sitting right there. How come he gets to call people liars and I get chastised for it? Somehow I'm some bad boy because I call the yes, guy a liar you and you call people liars. Try to control yourself, right? No, you try to control yourself. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Go ahead, Andy. He called him a liar. If I gotta okay. leave, Andy's gotta leave. Okay, better up. Go ahead, Dave. Better up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the College of Complexes. Um, we heard earlier from Tim about thorium uh, <coughs> molten salt reactors. Does this come in a blue box that says if it rains, it pours on it? Um, <laughs> With regard to the comments about nuclear power, um, I would say the following. First of all, the nuclear industry in this country never came up with a solution as to what to do with radioactive waste. And that stuff just piles up and piles up and is going to be a danger for hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years. That's number one. Number two, the nuclear industry took a great many shortcuts in the construction of the nuclear plants and lied about it. And as a result, you had, as Andy pointed out, the disaster at Three Mile Island, and in Japan, <coughs> the disaster at Fukushima. Um, secondly, some 40 years, 45 years ago, when I was in high school in Evanston, Commonwealth Edison was busy building its own nuclear plant at Zion. And they promised us cheap electricity. And they even aired all these little commercials with this cute little light bulb on it. <laughs> yeah, little Bill, who was like a bird in a light bulb. Little Bill! Well, the Bill doesn't look very little to me. And, and since that time, Zion had a lot of flaws, and they finally had to shut it down, and I understand they're in the process of decommissioning it. Yes, sir. Secondly, or next of all, we were accused of being, those of us in the environmental movement were accused of being Nazis. We were accused of being bad guys who are murdering kids in the third world. <laughs> yeah. All we ever have said is that we want a world which has renewable energy sources that don't pollute the air, that don't pollute our drinking water, and that provide a saner way to live. And finally, all these scientists who 
are busy being in the climate denier business. Well, they remind me of the sort of doctors and scientists who used to be quoted in the commercials some 50 years ago when I was a teenager, in which you heard something like, nine out of 10 doctors recommend anison or buffering. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> See you next week, Brown. All right. See you next week. <laughs> I don't usually come away from the college complexes terribly confused because I know that confusion is part of the atmosphere. <laughs> However, I don't know whether. All due respect to our speaker who gave a very good presentation. However, I don't know whether his message is relax, it'll pass, take the long view, or get your affairs in order but don't tell anyone else you're doing it. <laughs> uh, I got a mix, very mixed message here. And I'm one of these guys, I'm very uncomfortable when I start getting mixed messages because I am your typical reporter, I do like to see a nice press release with a headline and all of the salient stuff toward the top and then we work down in an inverse pyramid. Uh, you know the bit. And, uh, you know, it, it, it works. You know, I can't help it. The German Shepherd is the dog that it is. I am the dog that I am. And... Uh, I don't know what the answer is to this. Uh, I was at a party about five or six years ago. Seated next to me was a retired general. And we were talking about uh, the Middle East and the, the causes for modern wars and all of that sort of thing. And he said, the next war is going to be fought over water. And it's going to be fought on all continents. And he pointed out to me, that the day may come when we may be the new Middle East because we've got the largest, the largest body uh, of non-salt water, the Great Lakes. And that will become something that is much sought after. And we are going to be in a position perhaps to parcel it out uh, either very carefully and very justly or in a very, very greedy fashion. Um, we need, you know, in 1942, President Roosevelt called together a group of scientists, sent them off to a place where they were, you know, practically incommunicado for the next several years with the orders to produce a nuclear bomb. Perhaps, perhaps this president would do well to call together the experts on both sides of this question lock them up and force them to come up with a workable policy because we do not have one right now. On one hand, we've got the people who rightly claim we're polluting each other to death. And on the other hand, we've got the people who say, take the wrong view, uh, it will shake itself out. Will it shake itself out when our entire eastern seaboard is underwater? Is that the temporary inconvenience that we have to live with? Uh, or will it shake itself out when much of our country, once rich in agricultural land, becomes a desert? Um, I'm not an expert in any of these things, but I do know enough that when you are perplexed by these kinds of things, you call together the experts you put them in a position where they have to come up with some kind of a working policy so that we can walk away at least knowing what we have to do next. Right now, we have no guideposts. We don't know exactly where we're supposed to go. And I want to thank our speaker for coming up with one of the most provocative talks that I've heard here in a long time. And I mean that as a compliment. I also think we have to accept the fact that it may take us a couple of weeks here at the College of Complexes to come up with a solution that the world should follow. <laughs> hey, the butler done it. Next. Hey, Pat, the butler done it. All right.
Uh, Ram is that speaker to the last word? David Ramsey. You get the last word. Final word. Okay. I don't mind having the last word. Um, well, as, uh, as always, I like to um, try and reply to um, all the significant points. A lot of it was um, was not really uh, trying to answer my arguments, but just calling me names, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, free speech and everything. Um, uh, if the climate warms, there will be fewer droughts. If the climate cools, there will be more droughts. Um, if we look at um, if we look at the way the world was uh, ten thousand to six thousand years ago, it was a lot warmer than it is today. Um, and uh, there was no Sahara Desert. What is now the Sahara was covered with vegetation. Many animals, tropical animals. Uh, Thank you. Lived. more icy? Among this vegetation, there were lots of there was lots of water. The same is true of um, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and human beings um, lived there and hunted these animals uh, and drew pictures of them. Um, climate is like sex: if it's hot, it's wet. Um, and droughts always follow when you have cooling. Now, this, is, this goes throughout the whole geological time of the Earth. Whenever it gets cooler, that's when you get droughts. All the hottest periods are the periods where, essentially, you have tropical rainforest everywhere, Cretaceous, times like that. So, <clears throat> um, if you don't like droughts, uh, you should welcome a bit of global warmth. Uh, I, mean, I, I must say, um, there are certain ironies and paradoxes in this whole discussion. Um, one of them is that I would love to see the world temperature go up by several degrees, but I have, I'm absolutely certain it's not going to happen, or at least it's not going to happen for several million years, um, by which time I'll probably pass it away. Um, and um, so that's one, that's one of the uh, ironies. Uh, I'm, I'm resigned to it getting cold. Um, and um, I, I hope that the, for the sake of humankind, I hope that the present warm spell lasts as long as possible and gets warmer. Uh, but I'm not optimistic. You know, um, as we descend into a new glaciation, which once it's set in will last for 100,000 years, as we descend to that slowly over the next few thousand years, in all probability it will be slow, uh, we will see little upticks where the glaciers retreat for a couple of hundred years, where the sea level rises. Uh, and then the cooling will recommence, and we'll be headed down into uh, glaciation, where this part of the world will be uninhabitable. You'll have to live in the tropics. Um, so <clears throat> another irony of this whole situation is um, you listen to people in this country discuss global warming and what should be done about it. And there's a kind of air of unreality about this. Because nothing that this country does will make a dime's bit of difference to carbon emissions. This country could shut down everything, and the same for Western Europe. It's the industrialization of, Ch industrialization of China that is creating more and more, and India, and Brazil, but especially China. That's where the carbon emissions are coming from, in more and more, in huger and huger quantities. Um, and they're not going to shut down industrialization. The one thing that the ruling group in China knows is if they shut down industrialization, they're for it, as we say in the UK. Uh, they'll, they'll be swinging from the lampposts. Um, people in China know what a good life is, and they see it in Western Europe and North America, and they want it. And now they see it in Beijing, Shanghai. But they want it. Um, the people of the world want the benefits of modern industry. And they will get rid of any government that looks as though it's obstructing the path to that. And any government which starts attacking carbon emissions seriously is obstructing economic growth and an improvement of well-being for the majority of the world's population. That's what they're doing. So uh, the point is, it's unreal. 
because we're discussing this, and nothing the U.S. government can do will make any difference. Nothing. Any appreciable difference. Because it's happening in China. It's not happening here. Well, it's happening here, but it's less and less happening here. It's more and more happening in China. Um, so, <clears throat> the one thing we do know for certain is if you close down industry here, you close down industry here. We know that. That's 100% certain. Uh, it's a tautology. Uh, we don't know that it will make any difference to... Um, well, we know it's not going to make much difference to total carbon emissions in the world. <coughs> uh, so, uh, somebody mentioned the hockey stick, so I'd just like to briefly um, say something about the hockey stick. Uh, the hockey stick was something that Michael Mann and his friends came up with. That's your receipt. Um, and what they, 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 when you have a theory and you're in love with your theory, you try to make the facts fit your theory. This is not a criticism. This is what everybody does. It's, it's inevitable. Um, and what they realized, it was a big weakness of their theory, that it couldn't explain the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period. So they wanted to come up with a narrative where there was no medieval warm period and no Little Ice Age. Uh, and they did that. And so you have this hockey stick diagram where temperature was more or less the same throughout history. Well, the history of the last thousand years, which is all they looked at. And then it suddenly goes up like that. Now that looks like a hockey stick, right? Um, <coughs> what happened was that uh, a couple of Canadian engineers, uh, McIntyre and McKittrick, um, they uh, were st statistical experts, and they analyzed the reasoning in... Well, they, they started to analyze the reasoning in, uh, in the, the uh, Mann paper. Uh, they found they couldn't get very far, so they asked Mann to give them the original code and data. Mann wouldn't do it, and then started grudgingly dribbling it out and, uh, in, a in a deceptive fashion. Um, no, it wasn't available. It still isn't available. It still is not available. Go and check. Um, and... And... Uh, what eventually happened was the U.S. Congress, the Senate, um, commissioned Wegman, uh, and other, Wegman just about the most illustrious statistician in the U.S., uh, and, a, and a few other uh, of his colleagues, to, to investigate this. Now, <coughs> Wegman, <laughs> Wegman's report, yeah. it's online, you can read Wegman's report, uh, talked to many uh, catastrophists about this. And what they do is they start attacking Wegman. <laughs> this, it has nothing to do with Wegman's personality or character. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Wegman could um, rape a little boy every day and then broil him and eat him. Um, that does have nothing to do with it. Wegman's reasoning, the criticisms of the hockey stick paper by Mann et al. is laid out in Wegman's report. You know, there is a way to do principal components analysis. And Mann and his colleagues didn't get it right. They made they made mistakes in the way they did it. And if you don't do those mistakes, you don't get the result. Um, <clears throat> and there are ways to test statistical analyses. One way is to feed in random numbers and see what happens. If the result you're looking for turns up when you feed in random numbers, it means your study's no good. The man, the man procedure uh, if you feed in random numbers, it produces a hockey stick. Random numbers. Red noise, it's called. You feed that in, you get a hockey stick. In other words, what their method did, and I don't accuse, I, unlike Mark Stein, I don't accuse man of being a fraud. A fraud. I'll leave that to Mark Stein, who's now got a legal action going with, uh, with man. Not the National Review, by the way. They dropped out. It's just Mark Stein. Um, but... Um, what I do say is that there are certain innovations in statistical technique in man's paper. Uh, and they, they, it turns out they're the wrong way to do it. Uh, it doesn't pass the test. Um, so if you're interested in this, I urge you to go online, get the Wegman report, and read it. And read the arguments in the report. Forget about all the slanderous attacks on Wegman, which have come up since then from these catastrophists, because they're irrelevant. It doesn't matter if Wegman's a thoroughly bad character. 
All that matters is, is the statistical reasoning correct? Now, <clears throat> the, the uh, IPCC produces an assessment report every six years. It has done up until 1913, 1914. They produce part one in one year, the, re the other parts in, in the subsequent year, but the first part is the one that really matters, that catches the headlines, and that supposedly represents the science, the climate science. <coughs> so, in the assessment report following Mann's paper, the hockey stick diagram appeared in that, on the cover of that report, uh, and it appeared no less than three times in the interior of that report, and in the press uh, conference to launch that report, the background to the uh, assembled uh, producers of this report was a giant diagram of the hockey stick. So the hockey stick was becoming, over the next couple of years, it was becoming their hammer and sickle or their swastika of the catastrophist movement. It was everywhere. Now, six years later, there's no hockey stick diagram. And you see that they have moved away from it. It's been abandoned. Uh, the, 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 um, <clears throat> there's still people who defend it, I agree. There's still a little group of people who defend that. Uh, but uh, the great majority of catastrophists I'm talking about now will say, oh, that was unfortunate. Um, and um, so that's, that's what happened with the, with the hockey stick. Um, <clears throat> now, on freedom of speech, I see no reason why you shouldn't invite the Flat Earth Society to make a presentation here. I'd, I'd be in favour of it. I'd love and to I see it. no reason why you shouldn't have, um, invite someone who denies that there is any injurious effects from secondhand smoke to give a presentation here. I'd be in favour of it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with those two presentations, but I would be in favour of giving them, uh, giving them the opportunity to speak. Um, and uh, that's, that goes for anybody um, <clears throat> now. Um, I think there should be balance, and I think there have been many more pro-green presentations at this society over the past few years than there have been people like me, right? So, uh, so it's not balanced yet. Until you bring me back another six times, then it will be balanced. Oh. <laughs> uh, but but um, I'm not asking for that. I will come back, but I won't speak about this topic. I've got many other important things to do, um, to talk about. Um, <clears throat> now, this idea of doubt. Uh, I, I tried to get to this point. Um, I am not in any doubt that climate sensitivity is low. And therefore, catastrophism collapses. You have to understand it. This is a factual question. Is climate sensitivity high or is it low? It's a factual question. If you think that climate sensitivity is low, you have to abandon catastrophism. Uh, it's a, a matter of fact. It's not affected by what we think about it. It's, we have, if we want our beliefs to be true, as we all do, we have to adjust our beliefs to the facts, and that means finding out, that means discussing, that means analyzing, that means looking at the data. So, um, I'm, you know, um, I think that climate sensitivity is low, for, and I've given some of the reasons. Um, and uh, skeptical climate scientists have given many more elaborate reasons uh, in many papers, and as, as I said, what you've got to look at when you look at the scientific literature here is not whether these people say they're catastrophists, but what their conclusions of each paper are. You know, most people, there are lots of people working in branches of science who understand that there are ideological zealots out there that they'd better not offend. They keep, so they keep their heads down until this lunacy blows over. Um, and uh, it's only an exceptional kind of person who really relishes public debate. Now, most scientists don't. They don't want that. They just want to uh, work away uh, and be able to make a living uh, doing what they do, what they've uh, been trained to do. And that's what happens. So um, <clears throat> the 97% is totally made up. Um, basically, this is, the, this is why I emphasize at the beginning of my presentation that there is agreement on all these basic points. Uh, if you ask people, is there a greenhouse effect, or have humans affected the climate, you're asking questions which are meaningless, because everybody agrees with that. I'm amazed that you can't get more than 97% if you ask questions like that. Now, every few years, there is a guy, a climate scientist in Germany called Hans von Storch, S-T-O-R-C-H, who has done <coughs> thorough studies 
uh, you can and you can get his reports. He did the, the latest. He does everything as he does another one. He actually surveys climate scientists and asks them what they think. And it's it basically is not a slam dunk in a, in any direction. It's a very complicated range of views, which is what you would expect. Um, and you, you you ask questions like, do you think? I mean, a lot of the a lot of the arguments for catastrophism come from models called global circulation models, which are fantastically complicated programs, systems of equations, basically. That, that you have to have a super a supercomputer that costs billions of dollars to run them on. Ordinary academics in in a department can't run these models. It requires too much computing power. And and these models are bankrolled through the IPC and its affiliates. Uh, and they're horrendously expensive, and they all make the assumption that, that climate sensitivity is high, and they all fail to make correct predictions. They've been making dumb predictions that are too hot ever since they were begun. They've never once, they've never once got it right. Um, and every six years for the IPCC, they start again and they predict. And it's as though the previous IPCC report, uh, IPCC reports, never happened. Um, <coughs> So, um, uh, let me say something about the word denier. I do deny uh, catastrophism, but you know, um, if you believe something, you deny its negation. If you believe X, you deny not X. If you believe it not X, you deny X. So everybody is a denier. A denier, if you call someone a denier, you're just saying they don't agree with me. That's all you're saying. You're not saying anything more. So, um, uh, that I deny this delusion simply means that I am on the side of the truth. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Close us out, Brom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's have one more round for our speaker, please. I want to thank you all for coming. Hope to see you soon. We have uh, fire schedules here on the table. Breathing? Um, yeah, it should be called carbon cost. Breathing? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, it's not.